How's it possible that I've never set foot in a place this close to me before? It's kind of dark and eerie. If only it was covered in flowers, then it'd totally be a Disney castle. Oh, someone's here. I went to say hi, but she didn't seem very welcoming. Stay away from this spooky place before it sucks the life out of you, young girl. So that means you're not working here anymore? The maid just shook her head before she hurried off. Here comes my chance. Hey guys, Joe Casta here. And this Dracula-esque castle is none other than Mr. Joseph Williams. Are you wondering who that is? Hmm, I'm curious too. All I know about him is that he's my parents' creditor, and I'm here to ask him to extend the deadline for their debt. But as one of his maids just quit, I could work here to pay off the debt instead, right? Hello, I'm Jocasta, your new maid. No answer. Should I just come in? If anything, the master should blame the old maid for leaving the gates open. So I had to find my own way inside. Hello? I'm the new maid. Master, are you here? No? Not here. Not here either. Is he still sleeping at this hour? Oh, there he is! Huh? He's not old and gray like I thought he'd be. I introduced myself, then he returned to his painting, and coldly said, Work off your debt? Fine. Let's see how long you'll last. Just keep in mind, don't ever make me angry. Oh, Master, you're worrying over nothing. I wouldn't even care about you. But turns out, he wasn't worrying over nothing. He's actually infuriatingly difficult. The curtains must remain drawn during nighttime. There must be absolutely no noise at all, and his bedroom is strictly forbidden. Who gave you permission to sit there? Oops, I forgot. I must keep a distance of 10 feet from him at all times, even during meals. Phew, finally it's time to rest. Though I've been working here for a couple of days, I'm still not used to Master Joseph's ridiculous rules. Huh? What's that staring at me? What on earth are you shrieking about at this hour? You dare to disturb my sleep? Master, save me! There it is! It's coming! He stood bravely like a warrior, ready to fight the beast. Look at his broad shoulders, his hair, his chiseled face, and his every movement is so smooth. That hideous rat was finally running scared. What a relief! You're making a fuss over nothing. Move to another room tomorrow. This one is too shabby. Looking closely, my fastidious master looks kind of handsome, doesn't he? Well, living here isn't so bad now that I've got the hang of his rules. <laughs> Bring me a cup of tea. Yes, master. Here you go. Pass it to me. Huh? Are we off social distancing now? I excitedly handed him the cup of tea, but he missed it and tea spilled all over him. Clumsy dummy! Can't you look at what you're doing? I hurriedly wiped the stain on his clothes and apologized profusely, but he roared again. Stop! How dare you come this close to me! Get out! Jeez, his temperament changed like the seasons. Hot, cold, hot, cold, whatever. I'll just go home then. Indeed, no place like home. Oh, how comfy. I told Judy, my bestie, about my week working in the castle. Interested? Wanna come with me someday? No, no, no chance. Haven't you seen anything unusual there? Then Judy said rumor had it that a mad scientist once lived there, and werewolves too. His horrible howls could be heard during a full moon. You have to be careful. There's a reason why no one goes there. Oh no, it's today. Wolves howling under the moon? Never mind. Judy is just being childish. Who still believes in such fiction? Definitely not me. So, ta da! I'm back again. Honestly, I need this job. I can't let him fire me, even if I have to cling to his leg and beg, but where is he? Should I? I opened the door to see him lying there, surrounded by dull paintings, while tools scattered everywhere. What happened? I tried lifting him, nudged him, still he wouldn't come around. Then suddenly his eyes opened. Hey, the 10 foot rule doesn't apply because that was an emergency. Have you eaten anything since yesterday? As I thought, if you still want to kick me out now, you'll have nothing to eat. After that incident, Joseph seemed more at ease. He stopped threatening me with his rules and just let me ramble on. One time, when I was napping on the couch after cleaning, he even put a blanket on me. <laughs> I haven't slept yet, dear master. Then one day, a middle-aged woman appeared at the gate. She introduced herself as Joseph's mom and gifted him a beautiful bird. But she didn't come inside and just sarcastically said, Oh, my son's got a new maid again. This weird boy. So sorry for you, poor girl. I brought the bird to Joseph, excitedly told him that his mom just dropped by. Look what lovely present she got you! Lovely? That woman's just mocking me. 
I'm stuck in this place like a bird in a cage. I think it's a thoughtful gift. You seem to like painting birds. Stop prying. This is none of your business. Okay, I'm sorry. But it's your own choice to isolate yourself from the outside world. Come with me. I have something special to show you. Oh, this place is still as gorgeous as the first time I came here. Looks like Joseph is mesmerized too. See? The world is beautiful. You just need to look. We were walking along the blooming flower path. Then suddenly... He's coming! The wolf! Wolf! Then all the gardeners immediately scrammed in panic. What have I done to you, you morons? Beautiful, you say? Then Joseph stormed off. I tried to catch him, but... Ouch! I tripped over a rock! Oh, it hurts! It freaking hurts! Then let me apply the antiseptic cream. No, that will only make it worse. Maybe doing something fun could ease the pain. I'll be distracted from this. Please, can we watch a movie? And of course, he couldn't refuse. Oops, awkward. Clearly, I didn't think it through when picking this rom-com. I wonder what my master is thinking. Oh gosh, there's no need to be that emotional. His scary appearance startled me. Eyes turned white, mouth snarled, as if he wanted to eat me alive. I tried to stay calm to ask him what was going on, but Joseph was like a madman, frantically smashing things and howling. Stop, Joseph, please don't do it. Ah, my arm. Realizing that he just hurt me, Joseph seemed to regain his senses. He then ran off in a panic. I quickly hugged him. It's okay, it's okay, calm down. Once he'd felt better, he started telling me his biggest secret. Since childhood, he'd had difficulty controlling his emotions, which often led to outbursts of anger. Later on, the moon also triggered this reaction after his stepfather passed away on a full moon night, and it then became traumatizing because Joseph feared he'd been the cause of his death. That was also the cause of the tension between him and his mother. I think I was born with this strange condition. As a child, my stepfather used to give me some medicine to keep it under control. His stepfather used to give him pills? Judy also mentioned the mad scientist who used to live here. Is that... Hmm, I have to figure it out. One night, I sneaked into the room that Joseph forbade me to enter. On rummaging around, I found a tape that showed me the whole terrifying plan of his stepfather to regularly give Joseph a power-boosting pill as an experiment, and also to take him to the mountains to test out some new crazy invention. What on earth was that? But I can't tell Joseph right away. He needs to be mentally stable first. So I started off by taking him out for a walk, and when he felt comfortable enough, I suggested we go downtown together for some grocery shopping. He was just like a hedgehog, prickling up every time someone accidentally touched him. But of course, I know how to tame this hot headmaster, just like this. There you go. Then we started tidying and redecorating the whole castle to liven up the mood of this place. When we got to the last room, his stepfather's, he seemed a bit hesitant. It's been so long. This room also needs cleaning, else the furniture may become damaged. Do you know anything about your stepfather's videos? Uh, how do you know? Then Joseph searched for a memory card, then gave it to me. I was so scared that I hid it and never dared look at it. I wanted to destroy it once, but on second thought, it contains the last images of my stepdad, so I've always kept it here. Huh? This wasn't what I meant. So there's another video apart from the ones I saw. This may shed light on everything. If you don't mind, can I watch that video? I'm quite curious. From that day, we never spoke of the videos again. Instead, we went for walks, cooked, and meditated together. And today's schedule is this art exhibition. Look at his surprised face. <laughs> they look familiar, right? Don't tell me you don't recognize your own artwork. It seems that each painting tells a story. I can't wait to know who the artist is. They must be an experienced and profound person. I knew it. These compliments will help him erase his own self-doubts. Back from the exhibition, we notice a delicious smell coming from the dining room. Who could that be? It was Joseph's mother. Joseph seemed surprised by his mom's presence, but I wasn't because I was the director behind the scene. In fact, I secretly asked her to organize that exhibition. Watching the video cleared everything up. On that moonlit night, the mad scientist took Joseph to the mountains to test the effects of a super power boosting concoction. But when he saw Joseph reacting abnormally, he panicked and ran away. So the accident happened. It wasn't Joseph's fault. He was, in fact, a victim. I told Joseph's mom the truth beforehand, which led to this touching reconciliation. Now that things were clear as day, they have untied the knot in their hearts. 
His mother decided to move here to help him overcome his trauma of the moon with me. Oh, he also told me about the time he dropped a teacup on purpose as an excuse to push me away so that I'd be safe. How sweet and caring he is. Oh shoot, who left this curtain open? I hurried over to close it when suddenly a hand gently touched mine. Before you came, I really never thought I'd ever have the courage to face moonlight. But Jocasta, with you by my side now, anything feels possible. Finally! My spectacular sweet 16th is here! I spent months deliberating over every tiny detail of this perfect butterfly-themed party. Better yet, all the VIPs from the fashion industry were invited. Pretty impressive, huh? By the way, I'm Charlotte Stone, a fashion influencer with over 500,000 followers on Instagram. One day, I'm going to become an iconic designer just like Tori Burch. This party was my big chance to get noticed by all of these big shots. But wait, Ava? What on earth is she doing? Don't you realize how important it is to sort out garbage? It's not all junk. Like, this one is very valuable. Oh. My. Gosh! Ugh. And now she was replacing the guest's napkin with some biodegradable tissue. Suddenly, she startled and rushed to an incoming guest. Your scarf! Is that real mink fur? You ruthless monster! Oh no. That was Trixie Maxflower. The famous drag queen who's now strutting off in anger thanks to my sister's outburst. Ava was ruining everything with her hippie ways, and all of my guests were leaving. No, 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 it's all ruined, and it's all her fault. Ugh. This wasn't the first time Ava had pulled things like this. She called herself an eco-activist, and constantly brought rubbish home to remake into things, argued with anyone who didn't sort their waste properly, and forced everyone she knew to join climate change protests. The worst part was, I was always dragged into those dumb campaigns. It's super embarrassing being called the trash girl's little sis. Lonnie, where are you going? Wait up! Hey trash girl, why don't you recycle this into skating shoes, huh? Next thing I knew, a gross banana peel landed smack bang in my face. Lottie, are you okay? No! My party was going perfectly until you barged in with your lunatic eco-anxiety. I wish you'd left my party, not them. Actually, I wish I didn't have a tree-hugging, trash-loving sister at all. Then I pushed Ava aside and stormed off. She'd gone too far this time. But maybe what I said was a bit much? The next morning, I woke up to see a birthday gift from Ava on my bedside table. It was this cute bracelet. Made from recycled plastic, of course. It made me smile and reminded me of all the time she'd taken care of me. I went to her room to thank her for her gift, but she wasn't there. Then I spotted a letter on her bed. Mom, Dad, Charlotte, I'm going away to live by my beliefs and values without affecting you all. Don't look for me. Oh no, don't tell me that it's all because of what I said yesterday. She knew I didn't mean it, right? I'm sure she'll calm down and come back soon. But then, one week passed, then a month, and now it's been almost two years and my sister still hasn't returned home. We've looked for her at environmental events, but still had no hint. Until, one day, I stumbled upon a YouTuber who talked about discovering an eco-friendly island run by a community of environmentalists. Hmm, that sounds like Ava's style. Wait a minute, I've seen this before. This island looked just like the one from the picture hanging in Ava's room. There it is! That must be the island's coordinates! I gotta go find my sister! Oh boy, that was a long ride. Now I just need to find a boat that will take me to the island. Let's check the map. Huh? These are my stuff? Right at that moment, a woman reached me. Hey, what are you doing with my bag? I quickly apologized and returned her bag, then rushed back to the train to find mine. But I was too late. No phone, no map. What to do now? I asked around, but no one had heard of this eco-island. Hopeless, I slumped onto a bench, when suddenly a man tapped my shoulder and told me that his boat was heading to that island. I followed him to the harbor, but when I saw the boat, I immediately changed my mind and turned to leave, but the man wouldn't let go of my hand. 
I tried my best to resist, as his two scary-looking crewmates headed towards us. Oh no, this isn't gonna end well. Let her go! Noah, is this a kidnapping? Should I call the cops? Panicked, the man let go of me, then grumbled and left. I trembled in shock, and it took ages for my heart rate to return to normal. I can't imagine what Ava had to go through out there all this time. Why are you trying so hard to get to the Eco Island? It doesn't seem like you're seen. Now that I'd calmed down and looked at this guy properly, ooh, he was cute. And he knew about the island? Turns out he's a former resident and was now taking his sister there. I asked him if he knew anyone named Ava Stone, but he shook his head, saying that most people who came to the island changed their names to start a new life. Okay, so I just have to see for myself if Ava was actually there. However, Noah said he couldn't help, because the island has strict rules concerning newcomers. So I had to lie that I was also an eco-activist to convince them to bring me along. And... Ha! It worked! My hunch told me that I was now one step closer to finding Ava! That evening, Noah set up a tent on the beach and we waited there for a boat that was scheduled to take us to the island in the morning. Seeing Noah take care of Ellie made me miss my sister so much. My selfish stupidity had driven her away, but now I'm going to put things right. I'll definitely find you, Ava. Next day, Noah woke me up so early that even the gulls weren't about. We got on this rickety-looking sailboat without any engine. Hello? Were we going to the island or back to the primeval times? Noah helped sailing the boat while I had to take care of the ropes. This was way harder than it looked. I could barely feel my arm muscles. Best wind ever. Charlotte, you're our lucky charm. <sighs> but yeah, at least I had this beautiful view to compensate. Suddenly, the rope slipped out of my hand, causing the winch handle to spin and fling my bracelet into the sea. Oh no! Noah tried to stop me, but I was already deep in the water and immediately got swarmed by garbage. There it is! I pushed the trash aside, grabbed the bracelet, and was about to swing back when a fishnet caught my foot. Ah! I'm stuck! While struggling, I saw a dead sea turtle, tangled in plastic bags drifting by. Is it foreshadowing my own fate? Then, I felt a tug on my waist, and suddenly I was rising above the water. Through coughs and splutters for air, I saw Noah. He'd saved me again! How could you be so foolish? You're lucky I reached you in time. No, you're the lucky one who just got yourself a new girlfriend. Me? What's wrong with you? Your actions could have killed yourself and my brother, and all you can think about is flirting? I'm sorry, but that bracelet is really important to me. And I'm serious, what is your type of girl, Noah? M me? Oh, I... Maybe someone mature and brave? Got it. From now on, I'll be more mature then. By the next dawn, I could finally see our destination. But right when I stepped foot on the shore, two men who seemed to be village guards stopped me. You said you were bringing one sister, not two. Who is she? She's with me, Noah said. I tried my best to convince them, but they insisted on following the rule. No outsiders on the island. I didn't want any drama. All I wanted was to find my sister. Hey, the chief is coming! Jeez, what else is happening? I grabbed Noah's hand and hid behind his back. Please don't leave me alone. I won't. With my eyes closed, I heard someone step in and the female voice said, What's all this commotion about? Wait, that voice. I took a peek at the village chief. It's Ava. Ava, is it really you? Charlotte? I found my sister. I rushed to hug her as tight as I could. I've missed you so much. Oh, little Lottie, how did you get here? I've missed you too. I'm so sorry for what I said. I... It's okay. I've forgotten about it already. Come, let me show you around. Turns out, the day she left home, she gathered like-minded people to come to this island and save its ecosystem. They built this village and a dike to protect the island from rising sea levels. When Ava asked me about my journey here, I told her all about the struggles I had to go through and how Noah had saved me. You like Noah? I guess so, but what's wrong with that? I mean, you always hated my eco lifestyle, but Noah and I, you do know we share the same mindset, right? That's true. They had many things in common. 
Well, I was like living in another world to them. It's okay. I've changed a lot since the last time you saw me, Ava. I was wondering if I could, um, stay here for a while. Ava agreed. Yay! Now I will have some more time to persuade my sister to go home and to win my man's heart. So as the newest member of the village, the next day I started helping everyone with their tasks, like collecting coconuts, making DIY stuff, and planting corals. I even made use of my fashion sense and came up with stylish designs that were also environmentally friendly. Although Noah was too busy to see my creations, other villagers were very excited about them and often visited my workshop to try on new clothes. Hey sunshine, these designs are top notch. You're like a tailor goddess. Um, that's Sam, my coworker at the workshop. He seems odd, but he's actually a genius who could create technological devices out of scrapped materials. Each day he gave me a different kind of weird gift. This guy was definitely having a crush on me, but even his unicorn bicycle made from seashell couldn't move me, as I only had eyes for Noah. Speaking of Noah, he just walked past my workshop, right on time to show him this new material. I eagerly ran towards him, but stopped as Ava suddenly pulled him toward the hammock, leaned closer, and whispered something in his ear. What? So, when Noah said he preferred mature girls, he meant Ava? But what was my sister thinking? She knew I liked him! After that day, I couldn't concentrate on anything because of those two. Noah started to make excuses to not clean the coral reefs with me. And guess who was behind it all? Ava! Ouch. Great. I accidentally just stepped on the sea urchin. So I was rushed to the medical hut. Ava also came over to ask if I was okay, but I refused to talk to her. Or Noah. The wound swelled up, and I still couldn't walk normally a few days later. Surprisingly, Ellie started being nice and took care of me and even went spying on Noah and Ava for me. Those two are made for each other! I even saw them secretly kissing a few times! They're the perfect king and queen of this island! Now there is no doubt that they're dating behind my back. How could Ava do this to me? Feeling betrayed, I dragged myself to the workshop. Maybe work can distract me from all this mess in my head. But here I was, stuck with Sam and his cheesy pickup lines. You must be exhausted, because you've been running through my mind all day. Ugh, just leave me alone. I stormed out of there, but tripped and fell over. Right then, a hand reached out to help me. It was Ava. Jeez, she's the last person I want to see right now. You don't have to pretend you care about me. You know full well that I like Noah, but you still got with him. Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm leaving today, and so should everyone in this village. This place is for cowards who ignore the real eco-problems that are happening in the outside world. There, I let it all off my chest. But unexpectedly, the villagers came out of the bushes, holding decorations and a birthday cake with my name on it. They were throwing a surprise party for me. Oh no, I, I didn't mean to. Disheartened by my words, they all left. I guess you saw me with the chief when we were planning your birthday surprise. There is nothing going on between us. I thought you'd grown up, Charlotte. But I was wrong then. God, the guilt I felt right now was killing me. Frustrated and ashamed, I knew I couldn't stay here any longer. I waited until everyone was asleep to sneak to the beach and set sail on a small boat into the stormy night. But I couldn't make it far before a giant wave engulfed me and the boat. This is... The end, I guess. But when I opened my eyes, Noah's face appeared in front of me. Did you just save me again? No, the chief did. But where is she? Noah didn't say anything, but just looked glumly out to sea. Wait, this is not happening. My sister can't be out there, right? No, no, no. How can I live knowing that my sister drowned because of me? Are you crying for your missing shoe? I turned around to see Ava, alive and well. Ava, thank God! I giddily jumped towards her, but ouch, I forgot that my leg was still hurt. I'm so sorry for how stupid and selfish I was. Don't be foolish next time. Nothing's going on between me and Noah. He's all yours. I looked at Noah and we both turned to motto red. The next day, Ava gathered everyone around so I could publicly apologize to them. I was ready for the villagers to throw coconut shells at me, but instead they admitted that my words were partly true. 
This lifestyle needs to be promoted to the world, since everyone deserves to live in a clean and healthy environment that requires a joint effort. Then they all agreed that the perfect person to influence the young generation about this matter was me. Wow, I didn't expect that, but yes, I'm willing to carry out this meaningful mission. And Noah volunteered to leave the island and go inspire the outside world with me. Only then, Ellie apologized to me and confessed she'd made up the stories about Ava and Noah just to make me give up on flirting with her brother. I thought you'd only cause him trouble, but now I know he likes you a lot. So promise that you'll make life easy for him? I'll try my best, kid. Promise. It's been five years since we left the island, and I fulfilled my dream of becoming a famous fashion designer. But most importantly, I was able to make fashion eco-friendly. Pretty cool, right? When the fashion show ended, I went on stage and the crowd went wild with applause. My creative inspiration comes from my dear sister Ava, who's shown me how vital a clean environment is to each and every one of us. I also want to thank Noah, my incredible boyfriend, for his unconditional love and support. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. As I finished the speech, Noah came on stage with this huge bouquet, while Ava and the villagers showered me with hugs and praise. I guess one trip to an eco island could change your entire life, right? Hey guys, my name is Leah, a typical nerdy girl and a huge fan of Ace, the most talented, brilliant, incredible actor ever. But in the limelight, I transform into Aubrey Fern, the glamour star of the hottest movie right now. Fall me crush with the real life ace. How is it possible? Well, I just got really, really lucky. That day, I was walking home from college when I suddenly felt like someone was following me. Hmm, this sketchy guy was definitely up to no good. So I changed my route through this stinky alley trying to lose him, but he stayed relentless and chased after me. So you've chosen death then. When he was 10 feet away, I picked up a trash can and dumped it on his head grabbed a golf club nearby and started smashing non-stop. You creep! You mess with the wrong, innocent, helpless little girl! Stop! Who are you calling creep? I'm an artist manager from Moon Entertainment. Wait, Moon Entertainment? As an Ace's management label? Then why didn't you say so? Turns out his name was Grayson, and he's not here for my angelic voice or charismatic dance moves, but guess what? For my face. <laughs> this guy must be a comedian. A few days ago, you used the celebrity twin filter on TikTok, and the result was Aubrey Fern, an actress under our management, correct? Uh, yeah? Moon Entertainment actually created that filter. We were looking for someone who looks just like Aubrey to replace her. Okay, I must have hit his head too hard. I'd better get away from him quick. But he caught me right away and immediately teleported me to the company headquarters. Even the CEO himself came to welcome me. They were dead serious about me filling Aubrey's shoes? Heck, her whole identity! Apparently, the actress found showbiz too stressful and decided to quit. But she was one of the top faces of the company, so they couldn't just let her disappear. Out of nowhere, the door swung open and entered. Ace! He rushed towards me, genuinely concerned, and gently dabbed my nose dry with his own sleeve. So, this is who I'll be dating? Looking forward to that. W what d d d d dating that's right, Leah. I've just released a statement of Ace and Aubrey dating. People are going wild. As the new Aubrey, you'll get a once-in-a-lifetime chance to be Ace's girlfriend. Just for show, of course. But who knows? He seems into you. I... I think I just hit the jackpot. Aubrey 2.0, here she comes. The next day, I arrived at a top beauty salon for a celebrity makeover. From the shine of my hair to the size of my pores, everything had to be flawless and you wouldn't believe how many designer outfits and jewelry I got to try on. I look like a million bucks. Ace was gonna freak out the next time he saw me. You may look like Aubrey, but your personality needs some work. Jeez, who spat in your coffee this morning? Anyway, you better tidy up, cause I'm moving into your house. What? No way! You and your spiteful mouth should stay 10 feet away from me, or else I'll call security. Huh. Guess what, Miss Diva? It says right here in the contract that your manager, aka me, has to supervise you 24-7 so you don't spill anything confidential. You're bluffing. Am I, though? I stared at the contract, too stunned to speak. Why did I sign without reading it first? 
The guy's a nightmare. He even pretended to be an Italian exchange student and followed me to class. Weirdly, all the girls on campus were gushing over his fake accent. Say un porco. <laughs> I don't know what's more pathetic, his Italian accent or that you guys are actually swooning for that. Uh-oh, these girls did not know how to take a joke. Whoa, you guys wouldn't want to touch my face. My contract says it's worth, but before I could say another word, Grayson dragged me away like a rag doll. Other than that, life as Aubrey was amazing. I got to appear on loads of magazine covers, attended a bunch of exclusive events, and starred in the most anticipated rom-com of the year. And you know what the best part was? Ace was right by my side. Imagine being this close to your idol every day. You could just fall head over heels for him, literally. But no worries, people would still think that you're cute, as long as you know how to pose with the camera. One time, I heard Ace say that his ideal type is a girl with healthy, sun-kissed skin. So I figured I should give Tanning a try. But when I arrived at the film set the next day, everyone laughed at me, saying I looked like a half-dried up squid. This was so humiliating. Bet Grayson had a blast making fun of me. But instead, he rushed to put his jacket over my head to cover me up. Why are you trying so hard for that narcissist? You look ridiculous. I think she looks kind of cute. Just needs a bit of blending. It's Ace! He's standing up for me! His handsome face suddenly came super close to mine. Care to go on a date with me tonight? Yes, 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 a million times yes! I immediately went home after work, scrubbed off the stupid tanning lotion, and got ready at lightning speed! We're meeting at this private restaurant on the 32nd floor of a luxurious building. And there Ace was, the brightest star amongst the city lights waiting for me. He was so gentle and sweet. We were having the best time. His dreamy eyes looked at me like he was about to say something. Something sweet, I can sense it. When flashlights came from nowhere, blinding us. Paparazzi? How did they get in here? Aubrey, is it really you in the picture? Ace, what does it feel like being cheated on? What are they talking about? Just then, a strong arm suddenly grabbed my waist and pulled me out of the crazy crowd. It was Grayson. I'd never felt happier seeing his grumpy face. We got into the van, and Grayson showed us his article of me kissing a random guy at a beach resort. What? This must have been photoshopped. We gotta clear this up. Ace didn't listen to my words. His face was twitching in anger. Do you have any idea how this affects my career? Me being cheated on? That's just pathetic. Pull over. I need to get out. I can't stand you right now. He slammed the door shut, then stormed off. I was speechless. I'd never seen this scary and mean side of him before. Don't mind him. He could be a real douchebag sometimes. I'll get you some ice cream, then we'll go home, okay? Grayson's words cheered me up. I'm honestly touched by this cold hands, warm heart kind of guy. Grayson tried his best to shield me from the public backlash, but it was all for nothing. As Moon Entertainment let false rumors spread like wildfire. Now Aubrey, aka me, was being badmouthed everywhere. A tramp? A bimbo? Some even said I was a stain in Ace's career. That's it. I couldn't do this anymore. I launched into the CEO's office ready to give him a piece of my mind, but he was just chilling with Ace. Leah, just the person I'm looking for. I'm about to make an announcement stating Aubrey is not the one in the picture, and you and Ace are still deeply in love. No thanks. I'm here to quit. This pressure is all too much. Now, now, calm down. Maybe a nice trip to the city of love will help you relax, right, Ace? Of course. Let staff fix this while we take a break and maybe get to know each other better. Come on, I'll drive you home. The last time we met, Ace went bonkers on me, and now he's being as nice as pie. Talk about Jekyll and Hyde. Suddenly, he stopped the car at the riverbank and turned to me. Leah, I was wrong to take it out on you. I've never faced high pressure like that before, and I... I lost my mind. And you know what? That night, I was about to speak from my heart. I love you, Leah. He pulled me in for a kiss. It was so out of the blue, I, I didn't even know what to think. But then he opened his eyes and looked at me. So in love, I couldn't help but give in. Baby, I can't wait to be with you in Paris. It was everything I'd ever wanted, right? That night, Moon Entertainment finally cleared out the rumor. That's not all. Pictures of Ace and I kissing were making the headlines. How did they get this picture? Those paparazzi are so sneaky. I was so perplexed and for some reason kept thinking about Grayson and how he would feel hearing this news. I came to the roof to see him sitting deep in thought. Hey, haven't you heard? They cleared up my scandal. 
Remember, that's not your scandal, Leah. Don't let Moon Entertainment manipulate your life. You don't trust them? Yeah, and I don't trust Ace either. It's got nothing to do with Ace. He's my boyfriend for real now. Plus, we're going to Paris for a romantic break. Grayson let out a solemn sigh. I guess he was just trying to protect me from the company. But he didn't need to protect me from Ace, right? He still went with us to Paris and lingered in the background with a stone-cold face. I was embracing this moment with Ace, and as we strolled together, a group of fangirls recognized him and flocked around us. One of them even held him back, crying like a lunatic. Ace, don't you miss me? You promised! What are you talking about? Leave me alone! He pushed the girl aside, then dashed out of the crowd. I tried to follow him, but a hand suddenly snatched mine. It was a girl burying her face under a mask and pair of sunglasses. She snuck a USB into my hand and said, Ace's darkest secrets are in here. You're scaring me, what do you want? The girl tried to reply, but Grayson cut in between us and pulled me away. We ran and ran under the sunlight of a spring day in Paris. Why was this single moment way more romantic than anything I had with Ace, my idol? Could it be that I have fallen for Grayson? Grayson took me back to the hotel, looking somber as he turned to leave. At that moment, I realized I didn't want to let him go. He was the only one who understood me and got me through this crazy double life, not Ace. Neither he nor his celebrity lifestyle suit me. Ace would be better off without me in the way of his stardom. Grayson had tried warning me many times. Maybe the girl in the mask knows something. I plugged the USB into my laptop and a video popped up on the screen. There's proofs of Moon Entertainment manipulating the media all these years to cover up for Ace's scandalous private life. Dark things us fans have never seen before. His anger issues, his drinking problem, his cheating scandal. I scrolled down to see a dozen pictures of him with different girls kissing. And they're not just random girls, but his actual fans. I know them. Look, it's the crying girl this afternoon. And this one is a well-known admin of one of his fan sites. This was unbelievable! He'd been playing his entire fandom for fools! <clears throat> right then, I heard grunting sounds coming from the balcony. Someone was trying to climb into my room! Wait, the stranger who gave me the flash drive? For all I knew, she could be a dangerous stalker, given all this proof she somehow had. Panicked, I grabbed the USB, ran straight to Grayson's room, calling for help. His door opened just as the stalker reached us. He hid me behind his back and faced that crazy masked girl. Better not make another move or you'll be locked up in jail right this minute. The girl stopped, hands in the air. The moment we took off her disguise, I was shocked to the core. It was Aubrey. I know this seems crazy, but please listen to me. What you saw in that USB is the truth. Ace's manager provided me with it. What USB? And you didn't choose to leave the industry? The CEO even made all the staff delete your contacts and basically erase your existence. That snake has been lying to you all this time. I didn't quit, I just wanted a little time off to deal with my mental health, so I went on a digital detox for a while. When I came back, I found out I was already fired without a reason and replaced by a look-alike. I was so devastated I didn't know what to do. Luckily, Ace's manager reached out to help me. He's witnessed Ace's true face, and he despised it. But Moon Entertainment's trapped him in a contract lasting till the end of Ace's career. There's no way out for him until now. His manager has been secretly collecting and sending me evidence, then told me to come to you, because you're also one of their victims. Just like us. Gosh, this was unbelievably messed up. You know where he went after our encounter this afternoon? I shook my head in confusion, as she showed me a video of Ace making out with one of the girls earlier at a party. How could he be so shameless? Did us fans look like fools to him? No need to hesitate anymore. I'll take this douche down, in the name of his devoted fandom. I went on to play Ace's girlfriend both in the movies and in real life, while Aubrey used my identity to find a new part-time job as a monitoring staff at the National Broadcasting Station, the organizers of this year's Movie Sensation Awards. No way Ace wouldn't attend, since he was nominated for Best Leading Actor. Poor guy. He has no idea what's in store for him. <laughs> and there Aubrey is. With the help of Grayson, no one even notices we've switched back. I've also managed to earn Aubrey the host position for this year's award. Now take a seat, the show has begun. And the best leading actor goes to... Ace! Classic Ace played out his surprised and emotional act when he got on stage. I would like to thank my fans for the support they've given me all these years. I'd be nothing without them. Yeah, right. Now Mike, off. Lights, off. Here's the evening's main event. Ace's true face as a deceitful womanizer. Everyone gasped and started whispering. 
I shine a spotlight on the audience and a girl stands up. I'm one of the girls in those pictures. He told all of us girls he and Aubrey are just a publicity stunt so that we would date him in secret. I was his photographer once and he literally screamed at me for 20 minutes cause I didn't get his good angle. I'm a bartender at his frequented bar where he gets wasted, hits on girls and starts fighting with random guys every day. The audience start booing and throwing things at Ace. The cherry on top is that this whole fiasco is being broadcasted live worldwide. It's safe to say no one will ever be fooled by this douchebag again. Which means my work here is done. I go outside to see paparazzi and fans swarming around Aubrey. She handles them so gracefully it looks effortless. The limelight isn't for me, and that's fine. I'm glad I'm back to being a normal girl who doesn't have to care about public opinion. Best part is, I get to date my idol manager boyfriend over there. I'm thinking a nice home-cooked dinner to celebrate our successful plan. And our one month anniversary as well. What do you think? Hey guys, I'm Feather, and I look just like any other 16 year old, right? Actually, my life as a teenager is far from ordinary since I have hemophilia, a rare disease in which my blood doesn't clot properly so even a simple graze could be fatal. My parents are so worried that I might hurt myself that they keep me safely shut away in this mansion. In fact, I've never left it. Money isn't a problem to them as they own this massive energy corporation, so to compensate for me not being able to go outside, they make sure I get anything I ask for. My giant playroom is cool, right? Not only that, but I also own a dressing room with hundreds of cute Lolita outfits. And an enormous pantry full of my favorite snacks that I can enjoy at any time. You see, there's honestly nothing to complain about, except I suppose it does get a bit lonely sometimes. Until one morning, I was woken up by a screeching noise coming from downstairs. Are you kidding me? Do you want to burn my throat with this or what? What's going on here? I went over to the living room and was stunned to see a girl sitting way too comfortably on our couch. I was still trying to figure out who she was when she suddenly said, You, standing at the door, get me another glass of cool water. Now. Taken aback, I instinctively went to get her water. Then the girl finally looked up and seemed startled to see me. Oh my, I'm terribly sorry. I thought you were just one of the maids. Turns out she's Katie the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Forger, the two scientists that are collaborating with our family's corporation. My parents arranged for them to stay here to facilitate the research on the upcoming project. When I told her about my life and condition, she seemed really surprised. Oh, Feather, it's as if you live in your own tiny world. There are already flying cars out there, and they've just invented time machines too. You're missing out on so much. Really? How come no one told me about this? <laughs> I'm just joking, silly. Whoa, you weren't kidding about not leaving this place, were you? Then she started telling me about some of her favorite things to do in the outside world, such as watching the latest movies in the cinema, going to the mall where she could actually try things on before buying them, or attending all the fun festivals. It all sounds so cool. We chatted for ages, then I showed Katie around the mansion. Her reaction when seeing my dressing room and the playroom was seriously priceless. <laughs> From then on, I spent lots of time with Katie, but my favorite part about being around her were her stories about school, where she got to learn new things and make a lot of friends. Seeing my excited expression, Katie immediately suggested that I talk to my parents about maybe letting me experience it myself. Actually, it doesn't hurt to try, right? So at dinner, I gathered my courage to say, Mom, Dad, I want to go to school. I understand that you're worried for me, so Katie will come along to protect me. Right, Katie? Oh, yes, that's right. Feather is in good hands, Mr. and Mrs. Adams. My parents seemed very hesitant, but after a whole lot of persuading, they finally agreed with conditions. We'll join the most prestigious school in the state and have our own chauffeur. As for Katie, to avoid any incidents occurring, I suggest you get rid of the long nails and jewelry, Katie. We went back to my room after dinner, and I just couldn't hide my excitement. Yes, we'll get to go to school together soon. What should I prepare? What would you recommend? But then I noticed Katie staring in sorrow at her newly done set of nails. I'm so sorry, Katie. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? It's okay, Feather. What matters is that you're able to go to school and I'm so happy for you. It's bedtime anyways. I'll head back to my room now. I'm so lucky to have a friend like her. As I was indulging in my thoughts, a familiar voice startled me. Hey, I heard you two were going to school. 
Are you sure it's safe? Katie doesn't seem all that trustworthy. That is none of your business. You're just jealous that I've made a new friend while you're still lonely, aren't you? In case you're wondering, this guy is Liam, the butler's son. He was my childhood best friend and used to come to the mansion every day for homeschooling and to spend time with me. But we had some petty argument and I hadn't seen him since. Well, at least not until now. He was about to ramble about something else, but I slammed the door in his face. I wasn't going to let him ruin my mood. What I need to think about is my school day that's coming up. Oh my, it's so exciting, I really can't wait. Ah, we are going to Edgewood High today. So, I decided to wear my favorite Lolita dress as Katie suggested. Oh, I almost forgot, Mr. Freddy. He's been my best friend since childhood, and of course he had to come along with me on this big day. Katie also said I should try introducing him to everyone. That would help me make new friends faster. Such a brilliant idea. Whoa, we're finally here. Hey Katie, how do we find our lockers? Hey Katie, when is lunch? Hey Katie, do you know who's gonna teach us? Oh my god, Feather, stop asking, everyone's staring. Uh, I didn't even notice. It's probably because we're new. Hi, I'm Feather. Or maybe it's because of your extravagant outfit. Before I could say anything, someone spoke up. That's a lovely dress. Oh, you're right, they do seem to like my dress. <laughs> I waited for everyone in the room to settle, then confidently introduced myself. Hi everyone, I'm Feather, and this is my best friend, Mr. Freddy. As soon as they saw Mr. Freddy, everyone burst out laughing. I didn't know what was so funny, so I just awkwardly laughed along. After class, I asked Katie why our classmates laughed earlier, and what she told me was unbelievable. They were making fun of me. It's so sad to know, but I guess not everyone can be as nice as Katie. She also told me to dress down next time to attract less unwanted attention. It's a bit upsetting, but I guess I'll have to do what's best. So I listened to Katie's advice and ditched the OTT dress. Just like she said, people actually stopped staring at me. Here, hold this. You look really good holding books. Huh? That sounds kind of weird. But it's fine though. She probably wanted my help but was just too shy to ask. After the morning classes, I went to buy a bunch of lollipops, and that might look odd to Katie, so I let her know about how lollies are my special anxiety remedy. People here seem to be quite judgy, which got me a bit uneasy. You want one? Aw, poor you, but no thanks. By the way, I'll have lunch with David today, you know, the cute jock in our math class. So you're on your own this noon, okay? Then she quickly left without waiting for my response. I didn't know having lunch alone was so boring. Everyone has their own group, except for this one guy wearing a hoodie and a mask. H hi can I join you? But he didn't even reply, just stood up and moved to another seat. Did did I do something wrong? Feeling the anxiety taking over, I immediately took a lollipop to calm myself down. And it's doing a wonderful job at making me feel better. But suddenly, someone snatched it out of my hand. I chased after him, but slipped on someone's foot and fell hard on the floor. Panicked, I burst out crying, and I heard the guy that took my candy say, Ha huh, ha, huh, feather the toddler. Then everyone laughed at me again. Luckily, a guy spoke up. Stop this nonsense. What are you going to do if she's injured? Oh wait, it's the weird guy from lunch. He checked on me to make sure everything was fine, then quietly went back to his seat. I didn't even have the chance to ask for his name before the teacher came in. This guy was so strange, but there was one thing I didn't understand. Why was Katie also laughing? Back home, Katie came to find me in the playroom, and I questioned her about the incident earlier, and she quickly apologized as she thought they were just joking. She then suggested going shopping and offered to buy me something to cheer me up. And so I agreed immediately. We went to the mall the next morning, and I had the best time. We had iced coffee and some delicious pudding. Katie also got me an adorable little hair clip, and so I bought her a bunch of new clothes in return. We were about to head home when Katie said, Hey Feather, um, I have a cousin whose sneakers are falling apart. Would it be okay if you helped me get him a new pair? Of course, anything for my best friend. Making my best friend happy was the most wonderful feeling in the world. I'm so grateful to have such a lovely person like her to come into my life. But then the next day, I walked into class to see Katie being all lovey-dovey with the boy who took my lollipop. So that's the David that she mentioned, and on his feet were the brand new sneakers that were supposed to be for her cousin. Why is he wearing the shoes I bought? Then Katie pulled me outside and explained profusely, Feather, calm down. The, the shoes were too big for my cousin, so I gave them to David. I didn't lie to you, I promise. Fine. Please just don't let me see him wearing them again. I felt really bad since Katie seemed really sad after hearing what I said. 
At that moment, David approached me. What's up, toddler? You got a problem with my new kicks? I froze in fear. Then, thankfully, an announcement came through the speaker. David Peterson, please come to the principal's office immediately. Turns out he's in trouble for spray painting a teacher's car. At least someone already helped me teach him a lesson, but that wasn't all. A few more of my classmates also got detention for cheating on the math quiz yesterday, while some others got caught skipping classes. It was such a crazy morning. It's as if someone was trying to play the hero here. Finally, it's lunch break. Hoped things would be better in the afternoon, but... Huh? What is this? A poster of me? It also says underneath, Feather the toddler is the snitch. Katie took a look at it and said that the best way to deal with these kinds of jokes was just to play along. Um, I'm not sure about that, but it seems like the only way now. And so, I climbed on an empty chair in the cafeteria and started speaking loud and clear. Mm, may I have everyone's attention, please? Hi, I am Feather the Toddler, and I am proud of it. Instead of getting the response I'd hoped for, what I got back was food. The whole cafeteria was laughing and throwing food at me. I covered my face, trying to dodge it, but the floor got slippery from all the greasy food, so I ended up falling. Oh no! I scratched myself! I could only lay on the ground out of pain. People finally stopped as they saw me bleed. All I could vaguely hear was a familiar voice calling my name. I woke up in the hospital to find Liam sitting next to me. Feather, you're awake. Do you feel pain anywhere? Well, Liam? Why are you here? Where's Katie? Katie? You're still worried about Katie? She's the one who was behind all this. She told the principal about your classmates and told everyone it was you to make them hate you. What? How is that possible? Turns out, the guy who was always wearing a hoodie and mask was Liam. Liam had always been suspecting something shady in Katie's behavior. So, after failing in warning me about her, he decided to look out for me himself instead. I cried and tried to hug him despite the pain on my arm. Then, Liam showed me a shocking video of Katie talking trash about me to everyone. Oh, why was Feather carrying my books, you ask? It's because her parents work for my family's corporation and she'll do anything I tell her to as long as I give her some money. <laughs> Seeing the anger and also disappointment in my eyes, Liam calmed me down and said he had a plan to expose my so-called best friend. When I returned to school a few days later, I stormed straight over to Katie. It's you! You're behind it all! I already know everything. <laughs> Stop being ridiculous, Feather. You got busted and now you're trying to blame me. Drop the act. No one's falling for it. At the end of class, Katie suddenly gathered everyone. People, head over to the lecture hall. I have something very interesting to show you guys. Oh boy, I wonder what else she has planned. Liam and I quickly followed the crowd and found Katie standing on stage. Oh, Feather, I'm glad you're here. This is about you after all. The screen started playing a video of me sitting on my swing, playing with my dolls, and taking armfuls of candy out of the pantry. Do you see that, everyone? Feather is just a toddler in a teenager's body. Such a weirdo. I was waiting for everyone to start laughing, but the crowd stayed completely silent. Then, Katie hesitantly continued, Not only that, she's also the poser who snitched on us! Then, to her surprise, the angry crowd started booing and shouting at Katie, saying she is the evil snitch. Then they turned to me. Your rooms are actually pretty cool. I wish I had a snack pantry like that, it's so awesome! Katie sounded panicked as she continued talking more trash stuff about me, but no one listened. Turns out, Liam had set up a group chat in which he'd posted proof of Katie's actions, including the video of her talking to David, and also pictures of her coyly walking out of the principal's office after she must have snitched on everyone, and her putting up that mean poster about me. Katie, you're the one embarrassing yourself. Everyone knows that you're a snake in the grass. I trusted you, and what I get back are all these lies and schemes. I feel so ashamed for ever calling you a friend. As Katie looked around at the unimpressed looking crowd, she realized her game was up, and quickly fled the scene. Later on, we arrived home to see my angry-looking parents standing next to Katie's mom and dad, who had all their luggage packed ready to move out. Yes, Liam had already told them everything. In the end, Katie's parents made her apologize to me. Only after a lot of persuading did my parents let them keep their jobs. I never saw Katie again, but I did make a bunch of new friends that I invite around sometimes. The snack pantry is a big hit. <laughs> Now, I wear whatever I like without worrying about being judged. Most of all, I'm enjoying my school life, and it's all thanks to the help of my trusty soulmate, Liam. Here I 
am at a press conference standing in front of countless reporters. Oh, no, no, that's not me. There you go. I'm Alexia, 17 years old. I may look like a high schooler, but unlike kids my age, I'm a bodyguard. How so? Well, I was adopted by an underground security organization after being abandoned at a young age. Thankfully, Papa, my savior, was around to teach me everything from math to martial arts. Honestly, it was the happiest time of my life, but he'd gone too soon due to cancer, and it's like I was abandoned again. Didn't leave me any time to grieve, the organization put me on training from dusk till dawn, saying I needed to make my papa proud. So I always tried my best and stayed on top at martial arts. However, due to my clumsiness, I ended up as just a bodyguard for VIPs with a codename 036. How boring. <sighs> Until one day, I was summoned by the boss. 036, we have a special task for you. His name is David Smith, principal of Woodford High School. Another dull escort, again. <sighs> You will investigate Mr. Smith for a financial regulation violation by disguising as a new student at Woodford and collect everything related to him, his wife, and daughter. So be extremely careful. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Finally. Goodbye, boring bodyguard job. Time to prove myself. I'll make Papa proud. And to be honest, I'm also excited to experience the life of a high schooler. Now, I needed to do some shopping. Since I only have suits to wear on duty, I didn't know how to dress like a real student. Oh, wow. Look at all these dazzling clothes. After a lot of contemplating, I decided to take this pretty dress. This thing, and also these. They're matching, right? But the saleswoman asked me if they were for my little sister. Huh? What does she mean? Then she picked out something else for me. I was about to try it on when a scream startled me. Help! Thief! Help! Ugh, not a single day went by without trouble. I bolted in that direction and... Aha! Not today, thief! Are you crazy? I'm not the thief. Let me go. Just then, I heard a thud and saw another man in blue being tackled to the ground by two security guards, while a woman snatched the bag out of his hands. Oops, I just caught the wrong guy. I immediately released him. Turned out he was chasing the thief too, but no matter how much I apologized, he kept rambling that I was a violent lunatic and even suspected me of being an accomplice. This guy was unbelievable. He better wish he'd never see me again, else the next kick won't be a mistake. Today is my first day at school. My disguise was so good, even I couldn't recognize myself. There's no way I'd get caught. From now on, I'll go by the name Alexia. Much better than 036, isn't it? Wait, I know her. Bella Smith, one of my objects. <laughs> wow, the audacity of those girls to pick on their own principal's daughter. All right, Alexia's coming to your rescue. But not in my normal way. So, here comes a clumsy nerd who accidentally bumped into them, spilling coffee over them, buying time for the prey to run away. The mean girls let out horrified yelps, then yelled at me before running to the restroom. <laughs> Then, I turned to see Bella talking to a boy. Oh no, it wasn't just any boy. It was that obnoxious jerk from the mall. What are the odds? Then, they headed toward me. While Bella kept thanking me, I caught a staring look from this guy. You seem familiar. Have we met before? No, nope. no way. How's that possible? It's my first day here. Phew, he seemed not to recognize me. So, he's Clark, Bella's best friend. Now how am I supposed to approach her when her company was this guy? <sighs> Anyways, my first class is about to start. Now excuse me, I have this perfect cover of a schoolgirl that I need to keep up. Newbie, tell me, where was the American Declaration of Independence signed? Um, at the bottom of the paper, madam? The whole class burst into laughter. How embarrassing! But how was I supposed to know? Papa didn't teach me this. Then suddenly, I heard this alarming sound. Don't panic. I'll handle this. Follow me to the hallway. But no one did. Instead, they laughed even louder. I was still dumbfounded when a nice girl told me it's just an end of class bell. Oh, that's what it was. Finally, a break from all those exhausting lessons. Now let's check if the food is safe. Okay, pass. I was about to eat the carrot. Then the mean girls from earlier appeared. Yes, eat it. That'll help your poor eyesight. And this is for staining my dress. Then they strutted off. Ugh, 
In other places, those folks would have known the taste of my fist. Hey, Alexia. Alexia. So noisy. This place is like a beehive. Alexia. Oh, wait. That's my new name. I turned around to see Bella. She wanted to join me for lunch. Here comes the chance. But nope. The tag-along Clark is also here. Jeez. Ah. <sighs> I asked Bella why those mean girls teased her, the principal's daughter, but she just shook her head unknowingly. Hmm, but I think I've kind of figured out the reason after talking with her. I noticed that she was a bit slower than her peers, as when I cracked a joke, it took her a while to understand and laugh along. So, prying out information from her should be easy. If only... You've just moved here. How do you know she's the principal's daughter? Uh, uh, I heard from others. This party pooper. Jeez. <sighs> the first week didn't go too well as I was still getting used to being called Alexia and not inspecting my own locker. Also, this load of homework? In general, I enjoy learning stuff at school, but the mission hasn't progressed one bit. I had to pick up the pace, so using the voice changer, I tricked Mr. Smith to leave his office, then sneaked in there. But suddenly, Bella came in. Panicking, I blurted out I was cleaning the desk for the principal. She seemed convinced and even joined me. Another time, I saw the principal talking to someone in the hallway and was about to take pictures with my spy camera pen when Clark appeared and bombarded me with stupid questions. Jesus Christ, if things carried on like this, when on earth would I finish my mission? One day, I spotted Bella in trouble with the mean girls again. Ugh, do these brats ever learn? This is too much. I need to settle this once and for all. So I ran over and quickly pulled Bella away, telling her to run. Then, I threw my famous flying kicks, along with some front sweeps, and got all the meanies knocked on the ground in a blink. Justice served. <laughs> I dusted my hands together in triumph, but has Clark just witnessed everything? This guy was way too suspicious. He probably would ruin my secret mission someday. I need to look into this guy. And it didn't take long for me to find out he wasn't from a wealthy family like most of the other students. He got into this prestigious school on a scholarship for being brainy. Now here I was in Clark's family's bakery. Oh, this girl has his eyes and hair color. We talked and immediately clicked. She was Enola, Clark's sister. She has Down syndrome, but she's a real talent. Look, aren't her designs stunning? I was flipping through Enola's sketchbook when Clark suddenly showed up and dragged me outside. Why did you follow me here? I know you're up to something. Who is the suspicious one here? It's you who always coincidentally appears wherever I am. I only followed you here because you've been stalking me and looking shady. That got Clark speechless. Then his sister came to us saying, uh, Alexia, Enola really likes playing with you. Rather, let her come inside. His attitude completely changed hearing that. He gently told me that other people often tease Enola because of her condition. He also apologized for misunderstanding me and offered me a free cinnamon swirl. Wasn't this the first time I'd seen him smile? I'd never been so close to him like this. And suddenly, I felt something turning in my stomach. Perhaps I'd eaten too much. <laughs> After that, our conflict was naturally settled. Me and Clark became closer and I got to know other aspects of him. He was really gentle and helpful. The more we talked, the more flutters I felt. Oh no, what's wrong with me? Worse still, I even started to feel uncomfortable when Bella was close to Clark. He always helps her with the smallest things, like opening the door, holding an umbrella for her, and even opening water bottles. She always overacted as if she wanted Clark to protect her all the time. No, get yourself together, Alexia. No, 036, you have a mission to do. So, I faked having period cramps to get out of PE and sneak into Mr. Smith's office again. I rummaged through the trash can, but there's nothing useful. Then I noticed a locked drawer. And guess what? There was a notepad and an envelope full of money. Then by shading the paper with a pencil, the letters gradually appeared. It's an address and a time. So the principal's going to make a transaction there? Got it. Then on the way out, I clumsily knocked over a pile of documents on his desk. Wait. There was a picture of a woman holding two babies with scribbles. I'll love you three forever. But Bella told me she was an only child. Then who's this? And here's that place. The middle of nowhere. Exactly where something fishy would happen. 429. It's almost time. Someone's coming. 
Wait, it's the woman in that picture. She's older, but it's definitely her. And then Principal Smith appeared. They seemed really close. They'd been talking and he handed her an envelope. That envelope? So she was his. What now? Haven't given up on stalking others. Okay, listen carefully. I think Principal Smith is involved in a financial violation case. But not just that. I just got him two-timing. See? N no way. That's my... Okay, I will keep this secret for you on one condition. Let me join this investigation. The principal has been supportive of my scholarship. I don't think he's that type of person. What? He wanted to work with me? That sounded risky, but as long as I kept my mouth shut about the organization, I could spend some Bella free time with him. Good, right? A few days later, Clark told me to meet him at a cafe to discuss the investigation. But it's been ages and he still hasn't shown up. Then out of nowhere, a beautiful cake was presented in front of my eyes. Oh my, it's Clark, singing happy birthday and even gave me a present. Birthday? I myself didn't know when my birthday was. Why, he... And the cake, did he make it himself for me? Aw, he's so sweet. I got so emotional that I almost blurted out my feelings to him. But right at that moment, Bella, out of the blue, jumped in between us. Typical Bella, never leave us alone. Turns out, she was actually the one to insist her dad let her see my student records and make my first birthday cake ever. Thank you guys, I've never had a birthday before because I have no, uh, no, because my parents are always away. Then we should celebrate properly at your house, how about that? What? Why did he suggest that? But then Clark winked at me. Heh, <laughs> seems like we had a plan. Arriving at her home, we were warmly greeted by Bella's parents. It was such a delicious home-cooked meal, so this was what it was like to have a family. Bella had this all the time? But poor her, she didn't know about her father's a cheater. <sighs> we were in the middle of dinner when Clark asked Mr. Smith about a science project he was doing. Then Clark winked at me again. That's my cue. So I excused myself to use the restroom, then sneaked into Mr. Smith's office. This pen was magical. Let's see what Bella's dear father was hiding. Oh, he withdrew the same amount of money each month. Yay! Today was a success! Thanks to Clark's clever plan, I finally got something useful. Suddenly, our eyes met and he looked at me gently while leaning closer. I was ready for a kid when my boss called me. I did not assign this mission for you to play house with that criminal. You have three days, or else I'll have someone more capable taking care of this. Such a waste of your papa's expectation. Am I really that useless? Thinking I'd let papa down, I couldn't help but burst into tears. What happened? Who's that? Tell me. I'll handle him. Clark, it may sound weird, but I'm actually a spy. A uh, what? Clark was shocked, obviously, so we sat down on a bench and I blurted out everything to him. Clark didn't say a word and just gently held me in his arms, which made me feel so relieved. You may wonder why Bella and I were in this deserted place. The thing is, a few days after that call, my boss ordered me to bring Bella here to kidnap her and use the documents I gathered to blackmail the principal into resigning. I guess that could help me get rid of the third wheel Bella and have Clark all to myself, right? Oh, isn't that our school's vice president? So he was behind everything after all. Then suddenly, freeze, hands in the air. Oh my god, the police? Why were they here? Along with Mr. Smith and Clark? We're so doomed! Except, it was my master plan. After receiving the text from my boss, I almost followed his order. But then, I remembered Papa's words. He always told me to never lose my moral compass, and never harm others to achieve personal goals. Bella was a good person and shouldn't be punished for whatever her father did. I couldn't betray my first friend like that. So I told Clark and we set up a plan to find out who was behind all this. And here we are. The vice principal was revealed to have hired my organization to spy on the principal to overthrow him. And when he couldn't find any dirt on Mr. Smith, he turned to use Bella as a leverage against her father. How despicable. Also, I can't believe that the new boss led our organization down an evil path like that. But it's not the only truth revealed. But Principal Smith, how do you explain your monthly money withdrawal? 
I had a close friend who unfortunately passed away at a young age. He asked me to send his money to his illegitimate son and daughter, whom he'd kept a secret due to family pressure. So there's nothing more going on between you and my mom, right? Huh? What did his mother have to do with this? Turns out the woman he met up with the other day was Clark's mom. That means Clark and Enola were the kids in the picture? What a twist! In that case, thank you for taking care of my family all this time. How foolish of me to suspect you and mom, and even investigate you. My apologies. You… you investigated him before? Yes. Actually, it's not a coincidence that I caught you spying on him. Sorry for keeping secrets, but I knew with your impulsive nature, you'd jump to conclusions and approach my mom. Huh? Impulsive? That's how he saw me? Then he knew me pretty well. <laughs> Why is everything so confusing? Can you explain it to me? Did you befriend me just to investigate my dad? Bella, I'm so sorry for how things went down, but please believe me, our friendship is real. Fortunately, Bella was understanding, and we remained good friends. Oh, actually, good sisters, because the principal adopted me after I left the organization. <laughs> and I still visit the bakery often to hang out with Enola. Enola is so lucky to have a brother who takes care of her. I wish I could have one. No, sorry, I can't do that. Why? Because I'll take care of you in a different way. <clears throat> Why did this fence have to be so high? Oh no. That didn't sound good. It was time to get out of here. But... Ugh! I seem to be stuck! Suddenly, a security team was blinding me with a flashlight and telling me not to move! Not that I could anyway... <sighs> they dragged me down. Then the next thing I knew, I was being pushed into a chair and interrogated by security guards. But all they got out of me was silence. A few minutes later... Mr. and Mrs. Langston showed up. Yeah, they're the wealthy couple who owns this mansion. They're the people that I was looking for. I suppose I did owe them an explanation. I'm sorry for this disturbance, but it's not what you think. I saw your job advert for a housemaid, and I wanted to apply. But the guard said I was too young and refused to let me in. The thing is, my dad has a rare heart condition. And if he doesn't receive treatment soon, then chances are he won't make it. I really don't have any other choice. So please can I have the job and also six months salary advance? Right at that moment, a girl my age fell into the room, peered at the Langstons, then started laughing. Carla, this is not acceptable. Aren't you ashamed of your appalling results for the Francis Academy entrance exam? You should be studying hard to redeem yourself, not out partying at this hour. This Carla girl just rolled her eyes at them, then wobbly walked off. I noticed Mr. Langston comforting his wife, who seemed to be in much distress at the girl's inconsiderate behaviors. So this must be their daughter then. They sure seem to take her education seriously. And she applied to my school. Hmm... That gave me an idea. You know, if you want to improve Carla's academic performance, I can help you. They both gave me skeptical looks, so I showed them my academic records and told them how I was a valedictorian and had successfully scored a scholarship at Francis Academy. On hearing about my achievements, any apprehensions they had soon faded. And so, they'd come up with a plan. A risky one. They would pay for my dad's hospital fees until he fully recuperated if I took on the identity of Carla and flew to South Korea to study at an international high school there, while Carla would take my place and enroll at Francis Academy just as they wished. This deal sounded like the answer to my prayers, but I knew it would be tricky. Pretending to be somebody else in a completely different country was beyond my understanding, so I agreed to do it but only on two more conditions. First, a guardian must be present, who would take care of all my paperwork and stuff. Second, after I completed the deal and returned, the Langstons had to help me get into my dream school. 
the prestigious GBA University, obviously. They gave it a thought, then shook my hand in agreement. It looked like we had a deal! The next thing I knew, I was in an elite neighborhood in Seoul, Korea. Whoa! Talk about luxury! So this was what it felt like to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Mr. Preston dropped me off at school and repeatedly told me not to draw attention to myself. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, by the way, Mr. Preston is the Langston's lawyer, and according to the contract, he's also my guardian. He seems oh so serious, but I guess he's okay. Whoa, this school looked so modern, the architecture was a work of art all in itself. I wandered around the endless corridors and tried to find my class. Everyone seemed quite friendly, and the class president, Minjun, even gave me a guided tour. All the students' outstanding paintings, photos, and models were displayed all across the campus. Countless classrooms of different subjects, from science to art, just made me gasp in awe. I was admiring the artwork, when suddenly Minjin blurted out, Sorry, I've got to go. Miss Lee is looking for me. It'll only take a few minutes, so wait here for me, okay? Then he rushed off, so I lingered around the hall. That's when I spotted a group of girls nearby. I recognized the one from my last class. I'm sure her name was Isabella. I was about to walk over to greet them when I realized they had this one girl cornered and were making fun of her hairband. Ugh! Where did you get that horrid thing from? I suppose it must have come from some thrift shop or something. I heard that's where poor people shop. <laughs> Ugh, this whole thing disgusted me. They outcasted someone just because she didn't come from ridiculously rich households like them. Ugh, I knew that poor girl's feeling all too well. I gotta help her. But I didn't want to get anyone's back up and draw attention to myself. Hmm, what could I do? Ah, got it. Hey, the teacher's coming. I'll stall her for you guys. Run! My plan worked a treat, as Isabella and her friends nodded at me, then rushed off. I then went over to the girl asking if she was okay. Get away from me! She flinched me off her, and then ran off. Huh? I was only trying to help. As I turned around, I saw Minjin looking at me. A bit impressed, I think. He told me that the students here were divided into two groups. 90% are rich and the remaining 10% are poor kids entering under scholarships. Most of the students are quite friendly to each other. Well, except those I just witnessed. Isabella's part of the rich kid group, who think their upbringings make them superior to others. She's often mean to the 10% group, as she believes they don't deserve to be here. And as you can guess, that girl they upset? She's called Susie. She's in the 10% group, and she's the smartest student in our year. What nonsense! School is school! We're here to study and should all be treated equally! Too right, new girl. I knew there was something different about you. The next day, when class was over, Isabella tapped on my shoulder and thanked me for the warning. Then she asked me to join her group for lunch. I was about to politely refuse when Minjin appeared and asked me to join him. Phew! Thanks to Minjin, I had an excuse to quickly flee the scene. However, I did look back and see that Isabella was giving this offended look. After that, Minjin and I started hanging out more. We soon became close friends, and we both decided that the dynamics around here needed to change. So, we set out to help the 10% Club. One lunchtime, Isabella and her clan purposely bumped into this boy, causing him to spill food all over himself. While they laughed and pointed at him, I rushed over there took the food, and slammed it onto Minjin's face. Minjin immediately understood my intention. Then he also took a handful of noodles and smeared it all over Isabella. Cue the canteen erupting into one big, messy food fight. <laughs> Another time, the school was preparing for a cultural fair. One boy from the 10% group had this awesome idea to open a food stall serving traditional dishes from different countries. Everyone agreed, apart from, yep, you guessed it, Isabella and her snooty besties. Such a peasant. Too used to working as a waiter to serve others, huh? 
I winked at Minjin. Then we stayed behind and secretly wrote Isabella and her friends' names on the list of participants and submitted it to the teacher. Now, they had no choice but to serve food at the super crowded fair. The funniest part was they finally got a taste of their own medicine when the 10% group made the most of ordering them around and complaining. Ew, this ratatouille is too bland. Add some more salt. And this milk tea is too sweet. Start a new batch with less sugar. I have to admit, I was enjoying watching the mean kids squirm, but I guess my enjoyment hadn't gone unnoticed, as afterward, Isabella approached me. Those peasant kids aren't at the same level as you and I. I suggest you put more care into who you choose to associate with, or you could end up being treated like they are. Whatever. I just rolled my eyes, walked away from her, then continued to hang out with my friends in the 10% group. Isabella and her minions gave me dirty looks, but due to the Langston's name and fortune, that's all they could do. Just like that, my high school years passed by. I had some great friends, and guess what? Yep, I was now dating Minjin. I loved being here in South Korea, and I'd even grown fond of Preston, who despite being a grumpy gut, now felt like family to me. I mean, don't get me wrong, I missed my family back home like crazy. But Dad was getting better now, and we regularly FaceTimed. As amazing as my life was now, deep down I always felt like I was living in a dream. None of this truly belonged to me, and everything would be over as soon as I left this place. And eventually, my last week here arrived. As I was studying for my last ever exam, the SAT, I received a message from an unknown number. I know your secret. Drop out of the test, else I'll expose you. What? Who could it be? I called the number and a distorted voice answered the phone. I begged them to tell me why they were doing this, but they just replied, You don't need to know. Just do as I said. Then they hung up. Luckily for me, Preston isn't just an amazing lawyer, he's also a tech genius. Thanks to him, we tracked down the location of the phone. Hmm. I bet you're just as curious as I am to find out who it was. And now is the moment of truth. Huh? No way! Standing there looking startled was... Susie! Why would she do this to me? It made no sense. I mean, I know we weren't friends, but I had nothing against her. Why did she despise me to the point of willing to ruin my life like this? Please let me explain. Ever since you arrived here, I lost my top spot at school, which means I've also lost a full scholarship to college. My family will never be able to afford it themselves, so I decided to investigate you. And that's when I found out that you were not the real Carla Langston, and you got paid by her parents to achieve all these academic records for her. I get why you're upset, but... You didn't have to blackmail me. You don't strike me as someone who would do such a thing, so it's kind of disappointing that you did. I'm not. I... I'm a dead end, Irene. You have to understand. This is my entire future I'm losing here. And what for? So some rich, spoiled girl can get into college without doing any of the work? <sighs> it seemed like I had a lot of thinking to do. In the end, I realized all I felt towards Susie was pity. This was all my fault, and it wasn't fair for someone as capable as Susie to have her entire future ruined because of me. So, I had to be the bigger person here. I decided to ask the Langstons to give Susie the spot at GBA University, which was previously reserved for me as part of the deal. I mean, no worries. With this big brain, I could easily get in there on my own, right? And so, as soon as I was done with the test... I quietly left South Korea behind, without saying goodbye to anyone, including Minjin. Susie and I boarded the same flight back to the state. She couldn't help but thank me all the way there. And, well, let's just say, by the time the plane landed, we became good friends. But things didn't all go as swimmingly as I intended. It turned out Carla was even more negligent than first thought. All she managed to get was a high school diploma with shockingly bad grades. These were now my bad grades. My dream of attending a prestigious university was over. 
I'd just have to make do with a community college instead. A year flew by, and there wasn't a single day that I didn't think about South Korea or Minjin. I couldn't talk to him anymore. I promised the Langstons I'd cut all ties with my life there. I mean, Susie was the exception. One day while going out with Susie, she was showing me something interesting on Facebook. When we happened to scroll past a post of Minjin's, which read, Finally I found you, the love of my life. My heart sank. Wow, it looked like he'd found someone else, while my heart still pined for him. <sighs> but life still goes on, and a week after that, I was waiting for Susie outside of her college, daydreaming how this could have been my life. I saw a familiar face heading towards me. Was that... Minjin? But wait! He was with a girl. Carla! Hang on, his Facebook post was about her? The love of his life was Carla? I couldn't do this right now, so I willed back tears as I took a deep breath and turned to walk away. But suddenly, I felt a hand pull me back. It was Minjin. It's really you! I finally found you! I've been looking ever since graduation, and then my information led me here and to... Me! Carla appeared next to him and smirked at me. Hey, who am I to stop the course of true love? So I told him your real name and helped him search for you. I mean, you're smart, so I figured you'd attend this university too. No, you messed up my grades, remember? Anyway, it doesn't matter anymore. I turned and looked at Minjin. I'm so sorry, Minjin. I wanted to tell you everything, but I couldn't. He took my hand in his and gave me this adoring smile. I found you. And trust me, right now, that's all that matters. Being the awesome class president that I am means that it's my job to show this new transfer student, Willow, what's what around here. So, obviously this is the canteen. Heads up, don't eat the stew. Yuck. If you have any trouble finding something, just ask me. Well, I haven't seen you since middle school. What's up? Um, just still the same. Um, okay. Oh, you must be confused, but actually I already know Willow. You see, we went to the same middle school together, but to be honest, we never really talked to each other back then. She seems to still be as quiet as always. Oh, and by the way, I'm Natalie, but you can call me Nat. The next few days, I saw Willow always sitting in a corner of the classroom and doodling. She looked kind of lonely, so being a nice person, I decided to sit and talk to her. Hey, Willow, nice shirt. She just gave me this weak smile, then continued doodling. Ugh, talk about awkward. The best thing I could do was just to stupidly smile back, then swiftly left. I didn't really bother with Willow after that. I mean, I said hi if we passed in the hallway or something, but that was it. But it turns out Willow's introverted tendencies hadn't gone unnoticed by other students. As when we were on our school expedition to the woods, I overheard them talking about her. Do you all think that Willow seems a bit weird? Yeah, you're totally right. One time I asked to borrow her eraser, and she just gave it to me without saying anything. She didn't even look me in the eye, just kept on drawing. It was so strange. Huh? Are they seriously gossiping about a new kid? Yeah, so she might not be too sociable, but people should just learn how to respect someone's personal differences, right? Hey, Willow is new here. I don't think it's very nice of you to gossip like this. Also, she's my friend from middle school, so please stop this. But just wondering, has she always been like this? Um. Yeah, I guess. Actually, I was quite surprised to see her in our class. In middle school, her grades weren't that good, so it's kind of odd that she's in the top set with us. I could see the whole group was looking at me with surprised eyes. But hey, that was a few years ago. Now, so maybe she's changed. I quickly corrected myself. Then, a few days later, I was standing by my locker when suddenly my best friend Layla appeared and gripped my shoulders. Oh my god, have you heard the news? Everybody is saying Willow only got into top set because her parents made a huge donation to the school. Can you believe that? What? Who's spreading this absurd rumor? I don't know, but someone's saying that she wasn't that smart in middle school. Oh my god. Was the rumor culprit me? 
It was me. I did it. At the expedition. Oh no, I, I didn't mean to. Oh, how could I let this happen? Then when I entered class, I noticed a sobbing willow being comforted by some other students. I felt horrible. So I also went over to her and tried to cheer her up. Don't worry about it, Willow. Everyone knows this rumor is a lie. Why would anyone do such a thing? I mean, I just transferred here. Who would hate me so much to say something so mean? Oh, man. I sure felt guilty. Oh, could things get any worse? Um, yeah. Turns out they can. As after class, Miss Holmes suddenly asked me and Willow to stay behind. Oh, no. Did she know I was the one who started the Willow rumor? I sat there, sweating like a turkey at Thanksgiving, waiting for Miss Holm to bust me. But then, to my surprise, she said, Nat, please, can you help me get to the bottom of this horrible rumor? Phew, what a relief. But at the same time, I was freaking out. How was I supposed to catch the person responsible when I was the one who started the rumor? Albeit accidentally. Oh, what a dilemma. Wait a minute. I think I have an idea. What about I blame it on a troublemaker? It's not like they would care anyway. Whilst I'm a straight-A student, and getting into trouble for this could affect my chances to get into a prestigious college and ruin my life. Right at that moment, this guy called Bob shoved past us, then leaned against the wall and scrolled through his phone. Bingo. Gotcha. I put one hand against the wall and gave him a suspicious look. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Um, fine. So... About this Willow rumor? Who did you hear it from? Bob just shrugged and continued staring at his phone. Or did you do it? Maybe you were bored. So you spread the rumor to tease the new girl. Am I right? Or what? Only by then Bob looked at me. What? Are you crazy? I don't know this Willow girl. Besides, I was off all last week sick. Now leave me alone. Oh man, this was a massive fail. Now what should I do? I needed a minute to think. Okay, don't panic, Nat. You're smart, so you'll think of something. That's when I turned and caught a glimpse of Willow's sad face. Don't worry. I will find out who did it. I comforted her. But inside, I was screaming. I hated lying to her, but this was an accident. I never meant to spread that rumor. At that moment, Layla appeared and said she wanted to help. Great. Like, this quest wasn't complicated enough. Ugh. Layla told us that she heard the rumor from this nerd, Ben. So we all tracked him down and asked him. But he heard it from some other dude, and it went on and on until a girl said that she heard it from Ashley. That's when I remembered that Ashley was on the talking group in the expedition. Oh no, I had to stop this encounter between us. So when they spotted Ashley, I started making weird noises and made out I had a stomachache. They were still going to her, so I had to scream loudly like I was in labor. In the medical room, I continued screaming as if I was in a lot of pain. The nurses diagnosed that it might be appendix pain, so I immediately needed to be transferred to the hospital. I instantly stopped screaming as soon as I heard that and said, it's just that time of the month. Phew, that was close. But at least I've successfully stopped them from investigating Ashley. Well, I spoke too soon, because right that second, Ashley walked into the medical room. But thank God she didn't mention me. Instead, she said Carl told her about it. Phew. To my luck, Carl was absent today, so the manhunt had to end here. It would unfortunately continue tomorrow, though. As we warily walked out of school, I glanced over at Willow and saw that she looked really down. Ugh, oh, that made me feel so bad. So to make it up for her, I asked her if she wanted to grab a sandwich. My treat, of course. And she said yes. Mmm, that sandwich was so good. And Willow seemed to enjoy hers, too. It was great to see her happier, so I decided to extend our trip by going to the mall. Willow kept on glancing at this dress, but it was out of her price range, so being the awesome friend that I am, I bought it for her as a gift. Well, that's the least I can do after everything I'd done to her, right? But then I noticed something weird. When I was standing at the counter to pay for it, I turned around and saw her smirking. Then when she saw me looking at her, she immediately smiled and thanked me for the dress. Huh, so strange. The next day, the rumor scavenger hunt continued. Ugh. We cornered Carl and questioned him, but he couldn't remember where he heard it from. Layla asked him to think carefully, and he just shrugged and said he had no idea. Layla got suspicious, so she immediately reported him to the principal's office. I didn't even have a chance to stop her. The next thing I knew, we were being called out over the loudspeaker and summoned to go to the principal's office. Then Carl confessed that yesterday he got an anonymous message via Facebook 
saying that they were willing to pay him if he agreed not to tell the name of the person who told him the rumor. He showed us his phone, but all the messages and the user account didn't exist anymore. That's right. I was the anonymous user who contacted Carl yesterday. Thank God I deleted the messages and the account on time. But things weren't that simple. The principal decided to suspend Carl for withholding information. Finally! My plan worked! But why wasn't I feeling happy about it? On the contrary, I felt bad. Really, really bad. Blaming someone for my mistake wasn't right. I couldn't do that to Carl. So I stood up and blurted out, It was me all along! I started the rumor, but it was an accident! Well, and that's it. Cue a two-week suspension. Now Willow is refusing to hear my apology and everyone else thinks I'm some villain. Only Layla has stuck by my side and remained adamant there was more to the story. Then, a few days later, when I was trying to curb my boredom with potato chips and a Love is Blind marathon, Layla came by and told me the shocking news. There may be a chance that I wasn't the person who spread the rumor about Willow. The thing is, Layla continued asking around school and ended up with a girl named Rosa, who had a reputation for gossiping. Rosa told Layla that she was in the bathroom when suddenly a girl in the cabin next to her started telling her about the rumor. Rosa found it odd, so she bent down to see who it was, but the only thing she could see was a pair of pink Nike Air Force One. Then Layla asked me, You know who always wears those, right? I nodded. But objectively, there could be other girls who own the same shoes, correct? Fortunately, Rosa also noticed an important detail that will help us close the case. The right shoe has a tear mark. I checked our suspect's shoes, and they match. <gasps> so we finally knew who really did it. We just needed a plan to trap them. The next day, we called Willow to meet us at a cafe and told her that we found the real culprit. But when Willow arrived, she immediately got mad and yelled at me. Stop blaming it on somebody else. Maybe the person heard you when you were speaking about me during the expedition trip. As soon as Willow said that, Layla and I immediately looked at each other and grinned. What's so funny? I never told you that I spread the rumor at the expedition. I didn't even tell the principal. I only confessed that I was the one who said it. That's all. Willow looked shocked. Then we told her about Rosa and how she saw Willow's shoes. So Willow couldn't deny it anymore. Okay, it was me. I've never liked you and you think you're so perfect. So at the expedition when I overheard you talking about me like that, it made me so mad that I came up with the idea to spread the rumor about myself and then blame it on you. So you'd look like a horrible person and I'd get people's sympathy. A genius plan, right? Oh my, oh my. Who would have thought that the victim herself was actually the one who did the crime? Layla got so mad that she immediately wanted to report Willow to the principal, but I stopped her. I realized that it was partly my fault too. If I hadn't told people anything about Willow, then this never would have happened. So, well, after that, Willow and I stopped talking to each other. Actually, if I see her in the hallway, I'll purposefully walk the other way. But anyway, thanks to this incident, I learned some valuable lessons. Never, ever gossip, as it's just not worth it. And also, choose your friends wisely. Hi, I'm Viola, and today is a big day. You see... It's my first time ever acting in this awesome short film, but I can't seem to focus at all. Why, you ask? Well, that's because I just discovered I'm not real. Or, to be exact, I only exist in my best friend's imagination. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Until yesterday, I always thought of myself as a completely normal human being. <sighs> Let me tell you how it all started. The first memory I have involves my best friend Harlow. I woke up feeling dazed and confused and saw this pretty girl smiling down at me. She told me that I'd be safe now and that her parents were going to look after me. Strangely, I couldn't remember anything before that day, and no one told me what had happened. I could only guess that I'd probably been abandoned or something, and that Harlow and her parents were my saviors. So, from then on, I lived with Harlow's family who showed me kindness and love. When I first got out of the hospital, I couldn't do anything by myself. From personal things like brushing my teeth and washing my face, to chores such as doing laundry and dumping the trash. At the time, it was Harlow who guided and helped me, like a caring big sister. Then, when we entered middle school and the boys started flirting with me, Harlow was always by my side to protect me. 
She told me how they would never like a plain, boring girl like me, and that they were only doing this to get close to her, as she was very beautiful. If I had a decision to make, big or small, I always consulted Harlow first, as I knew she'd know best. But recently, I noticed that Harlow was acting short-tempered with me. When I got a better grade on my English essay than her, she told me I only got that mark as the teacher just felt sorry for me. Then she stormed off. Man, I didn't mean to upset her, and it was really unfair that the teacher didn't give her the grade she deserved, as she's far smarter than I am. Then last week, this boy called Hank in our school's film club held open auditions for his short film project. Harlow was desperate to be in it, so I decided to go along with her for support. I thought Harlow's audition was marvelous, but for some reason, she wasn't picked. I was about to leave too, but then Hank asked me if I wanted to audition. So I did, and you know what? I got the lead role. I was so surprised, and so was Harlow. She insisted that they were just tricking me, and I shouldn't take the part, as why would they choose a girl with ordinary looks like me to play the female lead? But still, I wanted to give it a try. Opportunities like this don't come twice, right? So I accepted the part. I know Harlow was worried that they were just teasing me, but Hank and his crew seemed nice. And maybe he finds my normal look suitable for the character. Right? The morning before the shooting day, I asked Harlow to lend me her pretty white dress to wear to the shoot. Harlow looked annoyed as she said, You spilled coffee on that dress last time you borrowed it, remember? You didn't even bother taking care of it, and now the stain's still there. No way! I remember washing it before returning it to you. Well, then you remember it wrong. It's my dress, so I'm hardly going to forget what you did to it, am I? Then she left in a temper. Strange. I remember using vinegar to clean the coffee stains, as it took me ages to scrub it off. But it is true that my memory isn't all that good. When I was a child, I once waited in the park in the rain for over an hour, just because I thought Harlow told me to meet her there on Saturday afternoon. I said Sunday afternoon? I have piano practice today, silly. So, maybe I misremembered again? And really didn't wash the dress for her? That day in math class, Harlow got caught texting, so the teacher confiscated her phone. At break time, she asked me to sneak into the school administrator's room to get her phone back. But of course I refused, as I was far too scared to do that kind of stuff. It's okay, no one can see you. Basically because you only exist in my imagination. What was she talking about? What did she mean by that? For the rest of the lesson, I kept thinking about Harlow's words. When the bell rang, seeing that I was still confused, Harlow pointed to a group of students standing nearby and told me that no matter what I did, they wouldn't see me. And that's true! When I waved my hands and talked to them, no one looked in my direction. I even snapped my fingers in front of them, but they didn't react at all. What is going on? Harlow told me that because she imagined me, she is in control of who sees me or not. Then she told me that if I still didn't believe it, I should go to the school administrator's room to get her phone. Then I'd see that she was telling the truth. The superintendent was standing right across the hallway, but Harlow assured me I'd be invisible to her. My heart was thudding like crazy, but I tried to shake back my nerves and continued to get her phone undetected. Whoa, the superintendent didn't see me at all! So what Harlow said was true? I only existed in her imagination? That means... Harlow's really the one who decides what will happen to me. And who I'll meet? So basically the author of my life story. But does that also mean that I have no control over my own life? Well, if I even have a life. Then Harlow barged into my room and said, You've never wondered why you don't remember anything about your parents, and about the time before you met me, have you? It was because I lost my memory after the accident. There was no accident, Viola. You have no previous memories because that was when I created you, as I wanted a friend to play with. I kept this truth a secret because I love you, and you always listen to me. But you've been so headstrong lately. After Harlow left, I found myself feeling so down. It turned out my whole life had never belonged to me. No wonder I was so plain and ordinary. All I am is a side character in Harlow's story. After a horrible, sleepless night, I didn't even feel like going to the film set anymore. 
and it's already late anyway. I was laying in bed, spacing out, when Hank phoned me asking where I was. I only exist in Harlow's imagination, so there's no point filming. Huh? What nonsense are you going on about? Stop joking, Viola. We're short on time over here. Seeing that I didn't even bother to reply to him, but just let out a long sigh, he continued. All right then, if that's the case, then you should at least make it count. Would you like to imagine yourself as just a boring nobody or a brilliant actress? I suppose Hank's words made sense, so I got myself back together and hurried to the film set. Even if I'm imaginary, I'll make this unreal life of mine unimaginably awesome. The filming was actually a lot of fun, and everyone complimented my acting. Hmm, they were probably just being nice, but it still felt good. Then Hank came over and congratulated me. Now that filming's over, you can be honest with me. I don't mind. I know you only cast me as the lead as you like Harlow. What do you mean? And the thing you said this morning as well about only existing in Harlow's imagination? I ended up blurting out everything to him, and you know what he did? He laughed. But when he saw that I was struggling to fight back my tears, he took my hand. Viola, listen to me. Harlow's tricking you. The only thing not real in all of this are her words, not you. No way. Harlow's my best friend. She would never do such a thing. If you only existed in Harlow's imagination, how come you still decided, on your own, to show up at film set this morning? How come you still meet other people without her being around? Like, right now? Harlow couldn't have written the script with all these little details, right? Come on, Vi. Think about it. But there was a time when Harlow made me invisible to everybody else. I snapped my fingers in front of them, and they didn't react at all. Hank asked me who these people were, and I told him. He said he'd make sure I saw sense. Then he left. This was so confusing. I cannot tell what is real and what's not anymore. The next day at school, when I was sorting my locker out, Hank dragged a reluctant-looking boy over to me. I recognized him. He was part of the group who didn't see me. Go on. Tell her everything. The boy told me how Harlow had bribed them to trick me. He also said that they distracted the superintendent so I could sneak into her office without being caught. What? I didn't understand why Harlow would do this to me. Hank went with me to confront her, and she faked a smile and said, Silly Viola, it was just a joke. So what about the fact that I can't remember anything about the time before I met you? You said there was no accident. It's also a lie, isn't it? I never said that. Probably you misremembered again like so many times before. I view you as a sister, Viola. I'd never lie to you. I didn't know what to believe anymore. I needed to be alone for a minute. This was all too much to process. So I ran to the nearby park to clear my mind. Suddenly, I felt something cold next to my cheek. It was Hank. He passed me some water and told me to drink it and calm down. Viola, I think Harlow's gaslighting you. She's basically emotionally abusing you to make you question your own sanity. I know you see her as a sister, but she's really toxic. Could it? Could it be possible that Harlow didn't have my best interests at heart? But what did she even get out of this, though? I'm not sure if this was because she wanted me to rely on her or she's jealous, but either way, knowing she could deceive me like that hurt like crazy. I didn't want to believe that that was what had been happening, but after all explanations, it's so clear now that Harlow was gaslighting me. And ever since then, I tried to avoid her as much as possible. But this was tricky, seeing as we were in the same class and lived together. I just wished I could grow up fast, so I could go to college and leave this house. At least there was good news. Hank's film in which I starred had gained attention on YouTube, and he was even selected to attend the short film festival with a view to supporting the city's young, talented filmmakers. Then, one day, I arrived home from school to see Harlow's parents drinking coffee with a strange woman. Huh? She sure looked a lot like me. Suddenly, she was running over to me and hugging me in her arms. Oh, darling, 
You have no idea how long I've been waiting for this moment. Following a whole lot of confusion, shocking revelations, and emotions, I finally found out the actual truth. It turned out that when I was seven years old, Mom took me on a yacht trip. Only, there was a terrible accident, so we took the lifeboat to shore. But then Mom fell out and ended up being rescued by another boat. We both suffered memory loss. In fact, Mom only remembered who I was when she saw the short film I starred in on YouTube. And then she tracked me down here. After that, I returned to live with my real mom. And guess what? I now realize just how awesome I am. I'm grateful to Harlow's parents for looking after me, but I still haven't forgiven Harlow yet. I'm trying to, as I know she's not all bad, but it's going to take some time. I also feel so blessed to have Hank by my side to help me discover my confidence and value my own worth. He even says I can be in his next film project, which I'm really excited about. It's good to know that I'm actually real, and I exist outside of Harlow's mind. The world is mine for the taking. And who knows, maybe one day I'll end up being a professional actress. This view of the Alps is magnificent. Wow, I've never felt this free before. <sighs> huh? Hang on, are those... Meowing sounds that I'm hearing? I followed the sounds to the raging river nearby, and there, stuck on a rock in the middle of it, was a terrified cat! Oh no, poor baby! I've gotta help it! I quickly grabbed onto the nearby tree, then leaned out towards the rock with an opened umbrella on the other hand for the cat to jump onto. The cat hesitated for a bit, before making the lead. But it's heavier than I expected! I lost my balance and tumbled into the river! I grabbed the cat just in time, but the strong current made it impossible to float. In a panic, I screamed for help, but the waves lapped over me, and gulps of water filled my mouth. And just like that, I felt my surroundings darken. Ugh, what was this wet, scratchy thing rubbing on my face? I opened my eyes to see that cat sitting on me. Thank goodness it was okay, but where am I? This seemed like some kind of rustic cottage house? Suddenly, a man walked into the room with a food tray. H who are you? Relax, I'm the one who jumped into the river to rescue you both. Turns out, he happened to pass by the river while we were swallowed by the current, and he didn't hesitate to jump in to save us, then brought us back to his home. Oh, um, thank you. For everything. Sure, here, eat up. So, how come you and Topaz fell into the waterway? Who? Oh, you mean the cat? How come you know his name? It says it right here. See? I'm guessing this is not your cat then? I told him how I accidentally found Topaz, so its family must live around here somewhere. Hearing this, he agreed to help me find Topaz's owner the next day. He even gave me his bed for the night, then walked out saying he'd sleep on the couch. But as a guest, I couldn't let him do that, so I just grabbed the blanket and went to sit next to him. You have a cool tattoo there. Kinda looks like a mini Mars, right? Nah, it's my birthmark. The only thing my parents left me. Hans then told me that he grew up not having a clue who his parents were or why they abandoned him. At 18, he moved out of his foster home and came here to become an herbalist. <sighs> I felt so bad for him, and in a way, I could relate. Being alone is difficult, but having both mom and dad won't guarantee your happiness. I was born into a well-off family with both of my parents, but the thing was, they only got together due to an arranged marriage, and they have resented each other ever since. My house always felt so cold and empty, and I hated staying there. So, as soon as I graduated high school, I took a gap year to travel the world. Actually, Switzerland is my first stop. Gotta say, it's nice to have someone to talk to like this. I guess Hans felt the same way by this look he gave me. He seemed very touched. The next morning, we took Topaz to the town to ask around. Turned out, today was their annual festival, so a horde of people crammed along the street to celebrate and watch the parade. Hans held my hand so I didn't get lost, but somehow the crowd still pulled me away and I ended up stuck among these sweaty people. Suddenly, a hand grabbed mine and led me out of there. Phew. Thank God, I couldn't breathe in there. 
And you know what? A super handsome, stylish guy was standing in front of me. Are you okay? That's when I noticed the tail of my shirt was ripped. Freaked out, I tried to cover it up, so he took out a silk scarf and tied it around my waist. For a second there, I froze to the spot, so amazed by his thoughtfulness. Just at that moment, my phone buzzed with a call from Hans. He told me to meet him at the fountain. Um, slight problem? I had no idea where that was. Well, lucky me, this gallant guy offered to take me there. We talked along the way, and I found out his name's Willard. He lives in a nearby town and was here for the festival. I told him I came to find the owner of the lost cat I'd found. Then, when I showed him the picture of Topaz, he couldn't hide his shock. Are you sure this is the cat you found? I nodded. He stayed silent for a while, then said, I might know its owner, but I gotta go now. Bring the cat to meet me there. Faye, it was nice meeting you. Then he bowed down to kiss the back of my hand before he left. How sweet. I watched as he disappeared into the crowd. Thanks to Topaz, I got the chance to meet him again. Uh, why are you making that funny face? I told him about my encounter with Willard and convinced him to come with me to the address on the handkerchief. He seemed skeptical at first, <sighs> but then gave in. I mean, other than this, we had no clue. It was worth a shot, right? The next day, we went to the place <gasps> Willard told us, but seriously, is this right? Why were there a line of people all holding near-on identical cats to Topaz? They even had the same collar as him. What is going on? I walked over to ask an old man sitting on a bench. He told me the millionaire lady who lives here had lost her dearest cat, Topaz. People said his name was on the top of her inheritance list, and she promised to greatly reward anyone who safely returned him, so these frauds were trying to deceive the owner by bringing some Topaz look-alike here. But Madame Primrose is no fool. Huh? Madame Primrose? The iconic designer and president of Wisteria Fashion Corp? That's right. Oh my god! I immediately dragged Hans to stand in the line. You see, my childhood dream was to become a fashion designer, and of course, the one I admired the most was none other than Madame Primrose! Ah! One of the reasons I came to Switzerland was to find her and hopefully become her apprentice. And now look, what are the odds? Finally, it was our turn, but... I'm gonna have to stop you right there. All right, everyone, listen up. Madame Primrose won't accept any toe passes from now on as she's tired of your deceit. So, disperse. What? We didn't just wait half a day here for nothing. Fine, I'll find another way to get in. We then walked around the mansion and found its side gate. Then, just when we were climbing over it, a maid caught us, but she didn't make a fuss out of it. Instead, she seemed a bit flirty towards Hans. Ooh, I had an idea. There's our chance. You go and charm her. He seemed confused at first, but then got the point. Hey, I think you're really cute. Hans then <laughs> tried his best at flirting, and as soon as she swooned, I asked her to help us return Topaz to his owner. The maid hesitated at first, but when we said that we didn't need to be repaid or anything, she agreed to let us in. We quickly split up to find Madame Primrose. I wandered the maze-like hallways, then I suddenly bumped into someone. Mind your way! Wait, I don't know you. What are you doing here? I, uh, um... She's my new friend. Is there a problem? I'm sorry, young master. It was Willard. He came to rescue me again. Great to see you again, young master Willard. You live here? Why didn't you call me when you arrived? Did you bring the cat? Where is it? Give it to me right now! Willard, calm down! Topaz is safe. I just found out his owner is Madame Primrose and- I'm her grandson. Just give the cat to me now. His agitated behavior didn't seem right. I took a few steps back from him, refused to do what he said, then ran. You don't understand. Just at that moment, Hans and Madame Primrose appeared. There you are. Are you okay? He worriedly asked. But boy, all I could see right now was Madame Primrose. She approached me, held my hand, and repeatedly thanked me for risking my life to rescue Topaz. This was amazing, but... Hmm, but why did Willard just leave without saying anything? Madame Primrose invited us to stay for dinner that evening. Joining us were Willard and his mom, Agneta. Madame then told me how much Topaz meant to her. Twenty years ago, she lost her son, Mr. Alvarez, to a car accident. 
then, a year later, her grandson Leroy disappeared. Her grief was almost unbearable, but then she was gifted a cat, Topaz, and thanks to him, she began to heal. I tried comforting her by saying she still had Willard, her other amazing grandson with an excellent fashion sense inherited from his grandma. But to my surprise, Madame Primrose said Willard isn't her real grandson since Agneta is actually Mr. Alvarez's second wife and was a stepmom to the missing grandson, Leroy, and Willard was her son with her ex-husband. I could see Willard and his mom were feeling so uncomfortable. Willard must have felt so hurt as Madame Primrose never even thought of him as a family member. Then, my train of thought was interrupted by Hans. Ugh, why didn't he just tell me to pass him the salt instead of sticking his right arm to my face like this? Suddenly, Agneta gave him a mortified look and spilled wine all over the table. Mom, are you okay? She didn't reply, but just left. I could tell it was because she saw Hans's birthmark. What could this be? Has she no manners? She must be unwell. I'll go check on her. So I followed her to the garden gazebo. That's where I heard her talking to someone on the phone. You had one simple job. Take that pampered Moggy miles away. Well, guess what? It came back. I gasped in shock, and right then, a hand covered my mouth. Shh. Be quiet. Oh, but it gets worse. The stupid cat brought Leroy, the missing grandson, home. That's right. I saw that Mars birthmark with my own eyes. If Primrose finds out about this, we're done. You hear me? Wait, so Leroy, Madame Primrose's only grandchild, is actually Hans. Uh, and... His stepmom was the one who secretly gave him away in the first place. Even worse, I was hearing the shocking news with her son. Willard, get it together. Do you know anything about her plan? I knew mom was behind Topaz going missing. That's why I tried to take the cat away earlier, to keep him safe from her. But, but Leroy too? That was just heartless. What should I do now? She's my mom after all. I could see his pure and kind soul being tormented and my heart <clears throat> ached for him. I know it must be hard, but you need to tell Madame Primrose the truth and make things right. That's a way to help your mom redeem herself, okay? He stared at me with those dreamy eyes of his, and I felt my heart turn to mush. But a phone call from Hans interrupted us. He was looking for me, saying we gotta go. Right, I had to tell him the truth. In a cab back to Hans's cottage, I told him everything, and he just burst out laughing, saying, <laughs> I'm Leroy, the heir of a millionaire. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm serious. You were brought to the foster home exactly 19 years ago, and you both have this one-of-a-kind birthmark. Okay, so what if I'm really her grandson? I don't even know her, and I'm definitely not rich kid material. You've been lonely your entire life. This is your chance to find the family you've always wanted. Hans was speechless. It seemed I'd hit his weak <sighs> spot, and he finally agreed. We asked the driver to take us back to the mansion. But no one was awake at that hour except a gardener. He led us to a library deep into the mansion, brought out tea, and told us to wait. Just a few minutes later, Hans started coughing, and his face swelled up. Oh no, he must have been allergic to something in the tea! Panicked, I screamed for help, and the gardener came back and carried Hans to the car. But then, a hand muzzled me from behind, and everything went dark! I woke up with my head pounding and unable to move. As I tried to make sense of the situation, I realized I was tied to a chair, mouth taped, surrounded by some rusty, unsanitary medical tools. And on the other side of the room, Hans was unconscious and tied to a patient's bed. Standing next to him was Agneta and the gardener and a guy in a blouse with some kinds of tools in his hand <laughs> about to do something to Hans's birthmark. I tried to scream and struggled to break free, but I couldn't move an inch. Right at that moment, Willard barged in. Stop this. Leave right now or I'll call the cops for your unlicensed business. And mom, I already know everything, so please have some remorse. Agneta looked so ashamed of herself. Willard, everything I did, I did it for you. Please understand. You saw how that old hag Primrose treated me. I was so miserable. Then your dad offered to help me. Dad? You mean Tim? How can he be my dad? be such a wimp, son. I stayed and worked here like a servant just to be close to you. We did all this so you can be the only heir. You deserve that. Now, finish it. I... I can't, Tim. Get away from my mom, you dirtbag. You never cared about me. 
You only moved here to manipulate her to do your dirty work. A terrible person like you will never be my dad. Then I'll do it. As he was about to lay hands on Hans, suddenly there was a meowing sound and Topaz appeared, followed by Madame Primrose. Step away from my grandson. You dared to live under my roof all this time and play foul tricks on my family? Take him away. Luckily, Hans came round and he had a tearful reunion with his grandma. They finally had the closure they deserved. Hans decided to stay in the mansion with his long lost family. He's even planted an herbal garden there for treating and healing people, as he always wished. Madame Primrose had finally found peace, as now she had both her beloved grandson and precious cat back. She also thought that maybe she'd been too strict on Agneta, so she decided not to press any charges against her. Agneta had also apologized, but she felt too full of shame to stay and decided to move out of the mansion. Willard followed his mom and helped her start a new life. What about me? Well, I got the thing I've always dreamt of, to be Madame Primrose's apprentice. That's her gift to me for bringing both her cat and her grandson back. And right now, I'm late for a date with a very special guy. Can you guess who it is? This school is so boring. All they do is talk nonsense and do nonsense things. Worse still, I feel like I can never escape them, as some of them live in the same neighborhood as me. But you know what the most annoying thing about my life is? That's Joy, my identical twin sister. In my parents' eyes, she's perfect. That's why she's the favorite child. Her allowance is more than mine and she gets to attend an elite private school while I'm stuck at the most boring school ever. How unfair! With a sulky face, I walked into my room whining. I think having identical daughters means our parents forgot that there's actually two of us. They've never picked me up from school. Don't be absurd. They just took me to collect my dress for the school gala. <laughs> a new dress for some fancy party. How terrible for you. I don't even want to go to the party. Trust a nerd like you not to appreciate what you have. If I were you, I'd make the most of every second of that elite school of yours. And if I were you, I would just enjoy my pressure-free life. We both sighed and stared into a void thinking about our tiring lives. Then Joy suddenly turned to me. Oh my god, Jade! Do you want to be me? Go to my school, have my things, and attend the gala? What a brilliant idea! Why had we never thought of it before? I'd live her fancy life and she'd live my dull one. That's perfect! Wow, this school is enormous. I tried to keep my cool as I navigated the endless hallways in search of Joy's locker. Ah, found it. I spotted a group of girls waving me over. They must be Joy's besties, Ruth, Nora, and Nell. Unlike my boring sister, they looked very glam in their branded clothes. What a power group. Wherever we went, all eyes were on us. Students handed us snacks, saved places in the cafeteria line for us, and let us sit in the front row of the basketball match. These girls were so interesting, that I fit in with them way more than Joy did. Talking about Joy, she somehow loved my boring old-fashioned school. I'd never heard her chat that much in my life, about how nice my friends were, how easy all the lessons were, and how cool the school bus was. Joy's friends were so much fun, and they did cool things. For instance, they always had shopping dates and bought each other expensive gifts without question. One time, Nora, the richest girl in the group, didn't hesitate in going into Kate Spade and buying the new release handbag for Ruth. I thought this was pretty awesome of Nora. But then, something happened that made me question the group dynamics. Ruth told me that she liked the red velvet cupcakes at the bakery near my house, and she asked me to buy her some. I was happy to do it, but the next day, when I brought the cupcakes and told her the price, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Joy, my dear, I don't care how much they cost. That's your concern. Then she turned to Nora, showed her a picture of a cute but expensive skirt, and told her to order it for her. Hang on. Had she always been thinking it was acceptable to order us around like this? I don't understand why an innocent bookworm like my sister would hang around with this cunning clique. They don't study at all. During the test, while I was still randomly circling the answer, Ruth kept on kicking my chair and urging me to let her copy my work. And as soon as the teacher turned her back on us, she even snatched my answer sheet. 
Huh? What's with that attitude? I took a look around and saw both Nora and Nell were also copying another girl's paper against her will. Rude! After the test, Ruth came up to me, hissing. Have you forgotten our deal? Huh? Deal? What could it be? Well, I guess I would have to put up with Ruth for as long as I was Joy, so I could return everything to her in roughly the same condition after the gala. What I really should do now is just to enjoy this elite school life, right? So, I didn't join Ruth and her minions for lunch, but bought food from this super cool vending machine instead. They even had pizza! But, the machine made these weird sounds. Ugh, I think my food was stuck. So I kicked and tapped it. But it still didn't work! <laughs> you dare get into an altercation with the pizza machine? You must be starving. Oh my god, this basketball boy was the most handsome guy I'd ever seen in my life. I was too lost in his eyes to realize the dumb machine had finally delivered my lunch. This gorgeous guy then leaned towards me and my heart skipped. Oh Cupid, I wish I was the one he picked up instead of the pizza. Here you go. Right before I could react, someone snatched the tray and pushed me aside to enter between us. Thanks Hayden, wanna share lunch with me? Huh, excuse me? How could she steal both pizza and a boy from me? The boy took my pizza from her and said, Thanks, but I'd like to share this with this cute starving girl instead. I'll buy the drinks. Wait, was he asking me? Then yes, 100% yes! Leaving a furious Ruth behind us, we walked to the bench table nearby. So, he's Hayden, the captain of the basketball team. We talked so much about our favorite comic books and even played basketball for a bit before classes. That was my best lunch ever. After school, I was about to leave when Ruth stopped me. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to mingle with Hayden? He's not wealthy. We have high standards about who deserves to be around us. Duh! Huh? She sure seemed to swoon over him earlier, but now that he'd turned her down, she decided he wasn't worthy? This girl's mindset really didn't sit well with me. As soon as I arrived home, I told Joy everything. You should listen to Ruth. Hayden must be bad news. I don't care what Ruth thinks. How come you do? Is it because of this deal you have with her? <sighs> Not your business, but stay away from Hayden. I don't want to get in trouble. Ugh, this vague hints were agitating me. What was it about? But whatever the deal between Joy and Ruth was, I wasn't going to let it get in the way of my blossoming romance with Hayden. Today, me and Hayden had arranged to meet at lunch again to play basketball. I excitedly walked out of art class just as the girl fell and dropped her painting set around my feet. I immediately picked them up for her, when all of a sudden, a boy's hand covered mine right before someone stamped their feet on our hands. It was Ruth! It was her who tripped up the poor girl too. She did all that on purpose to hurt me, but Hayden got there just in time to save the day. What do you think you're doing? Feeling too embarrassed being caught red-handed, Ruth couldn't do anything but give me a spiteful look before leaving. I couldn't believe that Hayden did that for me. His hand was swollen, but he just kept checking if my hand was okay. How can Ruth be so horrible? Because she knows everyone's ugly secrets, and she uses them to control people. Joy, she knows your secret too, right? No. Uh, um, I'm not sure, but I don't care. No matter what that secret is, she's gone too far. Don't worry, I got your back. So will I. Oh, I'm Katie, by the way. From then on, I no longer hung out with Ruth and her minions, but I kept quiet about this to Joy as I didn't want her freaking out and making us switch back places early. The more time I spent with Hayden, the more I found myself liking him. I wanted to confess to him who I really am, but I can't. At least not yet anyway. <sighs> Katie is really nice to me too, and she introduced me to her super sweet friends. Everything was just perfect, except my grades. Well, I didn't dare to tell Joy about this either. My study was pretty bad, and it literally ruined Joy's straight-A record. Meanwhile, Ruth, time after time, insisted that I was the one who had to do all her homework, research, and tests. But, duh, I couldn't even finish mine. You know what I've got. Yeah? What exactly is that you have? What's all the threat about? Ruth was stunned seeing me talking back at her like that. Yep, that was it. I've had enough. After class, she waited at my locker and signaled me to follow her to the equipment room. 
Finally, I can know what my secret was. Ruth showed me a video on her phone of Joy sneakily checking her notes during an examination. Was she <gasps> cheating? If our principal sees this, I'm sure your precious scholarship will be long gone. And what about that excellent student title of yours? So Ruth was using this to manipulate Joy. Does she do the same to everyone else? Do you think this would scare me? I don't think. I know. You don't want to lose everything, right? <laughs> no, Ruth. It's you who's gonna lose. Do whatever you want with that clip, like I care. And so, I walked away leaving a fuming Ruth behind. To be honest, I was a bit scared. Well, I know scores and things like academic transcripts were so important to Joy. What if I destroyed it all? After my last class of the day, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. The principal called me to her office and showed me the video that proved that I cheated on a math exam. She was so disappointed in my horrible grades recently, she even asked if it was because I was too caught up in my dating life and the bad influence I called friends. But how am I supposed to tell her that it was just my own incompetence? Nothing to do with Joy or Hayden or my new friends. I just reached my room door when I heard mom scolding Joy. The principal must have called her. It was all my fault. When mom left the room, I could feel how angry and frustrated mom was. Joy, I'm so sorry. I couldn't let Ruth have this hold over me. Um, I mean you anymore. I waited for Joy to take it out on me. But to my surprise, she was kinda happy. <laughs> That's okay. I think I should thank you for that. I've never been brave enough to stand up for myself, although I was so tired of getting picked on all the time. I was so scared, but turns out being scolded by mom isn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> My homeroom teacher also called me, but she only gave me a warning and told me not to make the same mistake again. I've never felt this at ease before, Jade. I'm not the perfect Joy anymore. Then, Joy told me about the pressure she felt to be perfect. One time, she even got sick before the math test due to studying too much. Not having enough decent revision and being afraid of getting a bad grade, Joy cheated and was caught and recorded by Ruth as evidence. We finally understood each other and decided to teach Ruth a lesson to stop manipulating and taking advantage of others. We spied on Ruth and secretly recorded her. And guess what? Turned out she was not as wealthy as she always pretended to be. All the brand names she had were from the poor victims that she called friends. I also filmed Ruth forcing the top students to do homework and essays for the rich kids while she just sat idly to collect money. I was so ready to post these videos online, but Joy stopped me. She told me if we did this, we were just as bad as Ruth. Instead, she had a better idea. She sent the videos to Ruth and demanded her to delete all of the student's secrets. In exchange, we would delete all of hers. Ruth, of course, had no choice but to obey. Wow, how mature my sister is. My last day in Joy's life has arrived. I'm just gonna make the most of it before I hand the reins back to my sister. Honestly, I kinda miss my normal school and my friends. But what about Hayden? Will he still wanna know me when he finds out I lied to him? I was looking around for Hayden when I saw some mean girls mocking Ruth for wearing a dress cheaper than theirs. So I walked straight up to them and whispered into their ears that I knew all their dirty secrets and they couldn't do anything else but storm off. Ruth gave me a coy look, mumbled a thank you, and then left. At that moment, a warm hand <gasps> gently clasped mine. Hayden! Wow, you're so cool. I... I'm not that cool, Hayden. Actually, I am... I have something I have to tell you. I then told him everything, from how I swapped identities with my twin sister to how I ruined her school life because of my childishness. You didn't ruin anything. Actually, you made things much better. So, since the pizza vending machine day till now, it has always been you, not Joy, right? Yeah, it's been me all along. <laughs> That's all I needed to know. Then he pulled me in for the best kiss ever. Do you know what it's like to be a pampered princess? Well, I do, because my dad's a billionaire, so the high life's mine. Not only did we live in a five-story mansion, but I grew up never having to lift one of my pretty, perfect, delicate fingers. I'm Sophia, 
and throughout my childhood, I had everything done for me. There was a maid to brush my hair, make my bed, and even do my homework for me. I didn't even have to search my walk-in wardrobe for a daily outfit, as I had my own personal stylist for that. So what? I'm spoiled. But I can't help being so perfect. I'm far too gorgeous to be stuck in a stuffy classroom studying. Not when I could be partying or schmoozing with the stars at swanky cocktail balls. But then, one morning, after a particularly crazy night out, I arrived home with a makeup smudged face and only one shoe. Dad frowned at me, and then he said, Sophia, you can't carry on like this. You're going to college, starting next week. But, Dad, I don't need to go to college. School sucks. Plus, we have enough money to last us several lifetimes. Let's just travel and have fun. But Daddy insisted I couldn't just sleep all day and party all night. Ugh! So... I decided to major in interior design for now. Some of the course was okay. I mean, I liked the pretty fabrics, but I just didn't see the point in being there. So after a month, I dropped out and planned a long trip away with my besties. But there was one tiny problem, as paying for this trip would cost way more than my allowance could cover. So I had no choice but to don my best puppy eyes look and ask my dad for money. Daddy, please. College just isn't for me. But I really feel that going away for a while will help clear my mind. He snorted. I highly doubt that, Sophia. You're lazy, self-centered, and you rely entirely on everyone to support you. You're 20, for God's sakes. So act like it. I pleaded back. But Daddy, I just want to have some fun with my friends. Then get a job and spend your own money on whatever you like. But if you carry on behaving this way, then don't expect any more handouts from me. You're lucky that I still haven't kicked you out, Sophia. But soon... What? That's so unreasonable. He was my father. It's his duty to support me. Jeez, did he not love me at all? I was so mad that I shouted, You're just some sad, selfish old man! Then I stormed out of there. I was instructing my maid to pack my suitcases when my mom came in and handed me a bank card, saying it's a secret between us two. Yay! Thanks, Mom. Now let the dream voyage begin. Wow, it really was heaven to me, with cocktails in the pool and lazy beach days. Well, at least, that was until my friends said they wanted a day exploring. It was hot and sticky out there, but I didn't want to be left alone, so I reluctantly tagged along. We ended up in this small forest area, and I chose to sit under a parasol while my friends went to take a dip in the nearby waterfall. Because, duh, I wasn't ruining my hair for anyone. I didn't understand how this could be anyone's definition of fun. I just hoped that my friends would hurry back. Then I heard footsteps. I turned around, thinking it was the girls, but instead, there were two men with balaclavas on. Oh no, this couldn't be good. I jumped up to my feet, and began to run, but my designer sandals weren't made for swift exits, and soon they caught me. I screamed out as a smelly cloth went over my mouth. After that, the world began to darken around me. I flickered my eyes open. Jeez, it was so sunny. Where were my sunglasses? That's when I heard two voices, and I remembered being kidnapped. I heard the one man say, Got her phone? The other replied, Of course! I don't want to upset the boss. I was so scared that I pretended to still be unconscious. Then suddenly, I heard the sound of the engine starting. I opened my eyes and saw the men driving away. Now, I was all alone in some field. What? Why would anyone kidnap someone, then just leave them in the middle of nowhere? My friends must be so worried about me. I needed to contact them. But how? I had no idea where I was, and no phone. Ugh, I should find a way out of this deserted place first, then borrow someone's phone. The kidnappers had left a bag next to me, which had a bottle of water, some snacks, and some gross-looking sneakers in it. Yuck, but I had no choice but to put them on, as my sandals were now torn. Ew, 
I would need so many pedicures to recover from this. I took the bag with me and started walking. After what felt like hours of torture, a farmhouse finally came into view. I whooped with joy and knocked on the door, but no one answered. I know trespassing is wrong, but this was an emergency, so I pushed the door open and ventured inside. I was just going to make a quick phone call, then I'd leave. But then, I accidentally stumbled and knocked over a vase. A smashing sound broke the silence. I panicked and was about to run away, but from upstairs, a man came down and shouted, Stop! Thief! Before I could explain, he grabbed my hand and pulled me back. I tried explaining that I wasn't a thief, but he gave me a skeptical look and said, Well, in that case, you can leave once you've paid for my vase. That's a collectible. What? This ugly thing? Ugh. I told him I would as soon as I made a phone call, so he doubtfully passed me his cell. I stared at it. Um, turns out I have never cared to remember any of my friend's numbers. I then thought about calling my parents, but no way. I was mad at dad, and asking for his help right now only meant accepting defeat. No, never. I told the man I would pay when I got home, but he refused to let me go. After a while of arguing, he forced me to stay and work for him until I paid it off. He even made up an agreement and made me sign it. And what other choice did I have? Yep, I was completely stuck here. This was the worst day of my life. He said his name was Manson. Then he showed me where I'd be staying. Um, this had to be a joke. It was a barn. Literally. There was an uncomfortable looking bed in there, and I could hear horses neighing in the barn next door. Was he kidding me? I was sitting there in despair when my stomach rumbled with hunger. So I barged into the kitchen and ordered Manson to make me some food but he just pointed at the eggs by the stove and told me to make myself something to eat. Um, sure, I'd definitely do that. If I knew how to cook? Manson just sat there smirking while I threw the whole egg into the pan and then spent the next half hour trying to work out how to turn the stove on. In the end, I gave up and returned to my so-called room with an empty stomach. If you think that was bad, well, things soon got a lot worse. At 5 a.m., a noisy rooster woke me up and then started my disastrous days at the farm. I accidentally dropped the bag of seeds onto the floor and got them in my hair, so the chickens chased me around the pen to get to them. I slipped over in the pigsty. Ew! I chipped a nail cleaning out the rabbit hutch. I even fell into horse manure. It was awful. Then on top of it all, Manson was so rude. He just laughed at me struggling with everything. But then one day, it all got too much for me. I was exhausted and felt so dizzy that I stumbled and broke two baskets of eggs. It really hurt so bad, and I was even in tears, thinking Manson would be mad. But instead, he ran over to check on me. Then, he even cooked me a nice meal and told me that I'd been doing a great job, despite the accidents. Whoa! What's with this personality change? So maybe he wasn't as bad as I thought? Over the next few days, I actually found myself enjoying Manson's company. We sat by the fire pit and watched the sunset. We went horse riding, and I managed not to fall off. And he even taught me how to cook. That's when I realized two things. Firstly, I'd been a brat. I was lazy, selfish, and I took everything for granted. But now I realized that with hard work came reward. And secondly, I realized that I liked Manson. A lot. So I decided to do something nice for him. I gave the barn a makeover. It was just simple things, really. I put a rug down, added some plants, hung up a few pictures and fairy lights. Then I dragged Manson over to have a look. He peered around the barn, then smiled. Sophia, this is so lovely. Then he awkwardly looked down at his feet. Look, I need to tell you something. Um, it's your dad. He hired those men to kidnap you, then paid me to let you stay here. I laughed over that ridiculous joke, but then he continued. 
Your dad wanted you to change your outlook on life and understand the value of money. He only has your best interest at heart. Wait, was this all just a setup? With teary eyes, I looked straight at Manson and said, I was going to tell you that I have feelings for you, but I suppose you don't feel the same. I need to go. Please tell my father to send someone to pick me up ASAP. Unless he's okay with me walking all the way back home without any phone or cash. Then I hurried out of there. He shouted after me, but I ignored him. I was so angry and upset. I continued walking until a car eventually pulled up alongside me. It was our family's driver. He took me home, then I locked myself in my room, refusing to come out. It took a few days for me to calm down enough to go confront my father, and when I did, well, I found myself running into his arms and telling him how sorry I was. He looked so shocked. I finally realized that my dad only did that because he loves me and he wanted me to see the true values of life. I told him I would resume my studies at college, but there was something else I needed to do first. I showed up at Manson's doorstep with some carrots for the horses and a new vase. On seeing him, he grinned, then gave me the biggest hug. Guys, life isn't all about designer clothes and expensive holidays. Sometimes, a stinky farm full of even stinkier animals and a cute guy, well, that can be the best place in the world. As for the future, well, Manson and I are both taking it slow and seeing where it goes. I do have big plans for his farm, though. I'm helping him renovate the barns into holiday cottages so other people can sample the country life, too. A part of me will always be a pampered princess, but as for the other part of me, well, it turns out she can make a mean egg bagel and outrun a pen full of chickens. Don't take life for granted. It doesn't matter how pretty and rich you are. Instead, there's far more to life than just that. Is it usual for you to sit on strangers the first time you meet them? This jerk. I'll show him that he's messing with the wrong girl. It's fine. Please don't hit him. Don't worry. And this is for mugging a kid. No, no, you've got it wrong. He just saved me from those muggers. And he was just teaching me how to fight back at them. Oh my. I thought... It was just because the boy's bag was on the ground and that guy was holding his arm like he was about to hit him. I awkwardly stood up, literally screamed out to apologize, then ran straight home. So, as you can see, my home's a little different from the usual. My parents run a nursing home, so I grew up surrounded by the elderly. You were so embarrassed that you left him laying there and ran away? The first time I met my husband... I also knocked him over with my dolio chagi. Perhaps this boy is your destiny. Poof! No way, Mrs. Jones. Suddenly, my dad huffed past us. Oh no, I know that look. Something was bad. Lately, our finances haven't been so good. I went after him to check he was okay and found him talking to a man in the yard. On seeing me, the strange man waved me over. Do you know this person? Huh? That was the guy I almost punched earlier. That's right. The person you almost knocked out is my son. I saw everything, so I followed you here. He's got in with a bad crowd and lost focus on his studies. I want you to steer him in the right direction. I... I don't want to be a babysitter. I'm sorry. It's too bad about this nursing retreat, isn't it? Seems like it'll have to close soon. Although, if swayed, I don't mind being a major sponsor. <gasps> this was insane! So, all I needed to do was keep an eye on his son, and all the nursing home's problems would be solved? Dad said I didn't have to do it if I didn't want to, but how could I say no? Okay, I'll do it! So, which school am I transferring to? Jeez, everything here was so shiny. But if I had a choice... This would be the last school in town I ever wanted to attend. 
I entered the classroom and walked over to the only empty seat that happened to be at the back. I was about to sit down, then... Ah! Some dude pulled the chair aside and caused me to fall onto my butt. A hand appeared to pull me up, but as I went to grab it, it immediately drew back, leaving me sitting there embarrassed while everyone's laughing at me. Oops, sorry. I guess I should only give a hand when asked, right? Ugh, it was Blake. I quickly regained my cool face, sat down, and put on my headphones, pretending like I didn't hear any of those comments from other students about my rustic look. This girl seems interesting. The usual. A grand if you can win her heart in a month. Deal? Blake glanced at me and sneered at the guy. Easy. Deal. So that's how it's gonna be, is it? Luckily, I hadn't turned my music on yet, hence why I heard the whole conversation. Let me help you get some extra pocket money then, Blake. And it didn't take him long to start implementing his plan. At lunchtime, he enthusiastically led me to the canteen, guided me to get food, and even asked the lunch lady to get me an extra portion of yogurt. Nice try. I was trying to enjoy my lunch when a shrill voice sounded out. Get up and get me some food. I want a cupcake just like yours. No! Jeez, why did some girls think it was okay to treat guys like this? Frustrated, I went over there, picked up the cake from that boy's tray, and shoved it into her mouth. There, happy now? Poor thing, your arms must be so broken that you can't get food yourself. Let me feed you then. You're welcome. Are you crazy? You're dead meat today. She raised her hand about to slap me, but I quickly dodged, causing her to fall to the ground. As for me, I calmly sat down next to the boy and had my lunch. Sorry for wasting the cake. You can have my yogurt if you want. He's Kai, my first friend at this new school. He's witty, smart, and has a seriously impressive academic record. He was actually here on scholarship, which explained why he didn't quite fit in, just like me. I noticed how Blake seemed rather annoyed and kept staring at me. I bet he was just fed up with being teased by his friends, since I just totally ignored him. Oh, but he didn't give up that easily. The next morning, he showed up at mine to pick me up, but I'd rather run two laps around the schoolyard for being late than share a ride with you. Then at school, he tripped me up and then reached out his hand pretending to help. But between you and the floor, I picked the floor. He even waited for me at the school gates with a huge bouquet of roses. But I just took one look at them, then started coughing. Are you allergic to flowers? <coughs> nope. I'm allergic to immature and boring people, like you. Then I walked off. Ugh as if every girl was going to fall for these lame tricks. This carried on for the next few weeks, but then one time, he approached me in the library while I was studying with Kai and handed me a necklace. I looked at it, then passed it back to him and turned to talk to Kai. Seriously? You're turning me down for this nerd? Kai's smart, gallant, and sophisticated. Unlike you, all you are is a troublemaker. Are you looking down on me? Oh, finally. I was wondering how much longer would it take for you to figure that out. Not to mention, you've not helped once with the English lit essay. You're in my group, but you probably just think the Grapes of Wrath is a rock band or something. So, if I can finish that essay on my own, will you go on a date with me? Fine, but it has to score an A, else you can forget it. And my trick worked. Blake actually completed the essay on his own. He's smart, but he's neglectful of his studies, and it's made him make mistakes. On being handed back the essay, Blake's face fell. He got a B, and even though he knew it was over, he still stayed in class to reread the teacher's comments. It seemed like this was the first time he actually put in the effort to do something. <laughs> What's wrong? Still in denial of your failure? Blake turned away without looking at me. The rich boy who lost the game for the first time looked so cute. So I put a gift with a message in it on Blake's desk. Needless to say, he was over the moon. In it was a set of clothes I'd bought for him and an invitation to a bar at the weekend. Why, you wonder? Oh, 
You'll see. That Saturday night, Blake showed up in the outfit I had gifted him and looked anything but pleased. <laughs> I can't come in wearing this. It's so old-fashioned. My friends will laugh at me. You invited your friends, too? To prove that you won the bet, right? If you get that thousand dollars, will I have a share? You already knew it? I was just joking at first. But now... Let's go inside now. Don't worry. We won't be here for long. I dragged him inside, and immediately, his friends didn't miss the opportunity to tease me. Did the fish get hooked? Yes, I'm trapped. Quickly give him a grand. His family is bankrupt and in dire need of money. Huh? What? You're lying. Look, he's wearing donated clothes. Even his branded clothes have been liquidated. I winked at Blake, and he immediately reacted. Lend me some money. I need a place to stay, a sports car, and pocket money too. At this point, his friends turned nasty and told him he no longer qualified to be in their group. You didn't have to do that. I already knew they only hung out with me for the money. But that's what people are just like. <sighs> Why would he think that? He must have never been cared for and loved properly. Get rid of that face. This is a date, after all. Let me make it up to you. A bar that matches this outfit. So I dragged Blake to our evening party. I told everyone that I brought a friend to lend a hand, and the elderly immediately made him do all sorts of things. Mrs. Hastings asked him to climb the tree to hang the string lights. Mr. Derbyshire called him to chop wood for the campfire, and Mr. Shaw wanted him to taste his homebrewed beer. Then the next second, Blake's already sitting on the drum throne. Huh, <laughs> it's been a long time since we had a young volunteer. That boy seems fine, doesn't he? I saw the way he looked at you. He's not suitable for me. I shrugged in response to her and suddenly felt disappointed. Yes, I liked this different side to him, but we were still from different worlds. The next morning at school, I still saw Blake hanging out with his greedy friends. Looks like he hadn't learned his lesson. Frustrated that all my efforts were in vain, I swung open my locker. Hmm, what was this note? Meet me at the library at 6 p.m. when everyone has left. I have a surprise for you. B. I shouldn't be like this, right? Waiting for him at the library for hours until everyone left, nervous and excited? But as soon as the last person left, the lights suddenly went out, and the library door slammed shut. What's happening? Could it be that the note wasn't from Blake? I screamed out of fear. That's right. I may excel at martial arts, but I hate the dark. With a shaking hand, I dialed the phone to call Blake and then slumped down in fear and sobbed. At that moment, the sound of the door unlocking startled me. As soon as the door opened, I quickly ran to hug Blake. Are you okay? I can't believe Chloe did this. I told you not to get near them. Huh? This wasn't Blake's voice. Freya, are you okay? Oh my god, it was Kai who opened the door to save me. But I thought that... I quickly let go of him, then ran away in embarrassment. That's strange. When I was in danger, the first person I thought of was Blake. Could it be that I... really liked him? At that moment, the phone rang. It was my dad. Mrs. Jones had suffered a heart attack and needed surgery immediately. But the surgery cost was so much. Where could we get that money? Ah, oh, yes. Blake's dad. So I called him. Hello, is this Mr. Morris? Blake stopped hanging out with his friends and did his homework. I really need the money now. Please, it's urgent. Are you bringing me out to trade with my dad? My God, it seems like Blake heard all the conversation. I, I, so I'm just your money-making tool? And all this time you've trained me as your pet? It's not like that. We'll talk later. There's no time for your selfish thoughts right now. I gotta go. I ran like crazy to the hospital. My parents were desperate and the money hadn't arrived yet. So I called Mr. Morris again. You said Blake had changed. 
if this is the case, then why did he just get fined for speeding and resisting police? Don't ever call me again. Don't worry, Freya. I'll sell the nursing home land to take care of Mrs. Jones. Everyone's agreed to move to the government nursing home. We sold our house, and now we live with Mrs. Jones in a new town. She's so much better now, but I do miss the other elderly people. Also, I miss Blake. I still keep in touch with Kai, and he told me that Blake has gone to some military school like his dad wanted. Well, that's unexpected from him. You should talk to that guy. Not about what you did, but confess your feelings to him. That will save you from regrets later. Then she patted me on the shoulder to comfort me. But I really don't have the courage to do it. I was feeling guilty. Mrs. Jones, you have a letter. Freya, look. It's the invitation to a nursing home concert. It's our concert, isn't it? Trembling, I took the invitation. What is this? I pushed Mrs. Jones's wheelchair to the door of the nursing home named Sunflower. When we walked in, we all burst into tears. Everyone was there. This is all Blake's doing. He's such a kind boy. He found us and built us a dream nursing home. You and Freya were the surprise gift we prepared for him, but as soon as he saw the two of you, he ran away. Hearing that, I rushed to the gate. A car passed me. My gut told me it was him. I ran after it and shouted in despair, Blake, wait! I like you! I really like you! But the car quickly went out of sight. I helplessly slumped down on the street, tears streaming down my face, and I still muttered, I really do like you. What are you saying? Say it louder. I turned around startled. It was Blake. He was in his military uniform and smiling at me fondly. Hey Beans, welcome back to my channel. I'm so cranked to introduce today's special guest, my daughter Elle. Say hi, sweetie. Hi, we're making butter from scratch today. I'm so excited. Elle, can you please do this properly? Mom, it's the sixth take already. I can't even film my arms anymore. If you're still not satisfied, then film it yourself. Hey, I'm Elle, a high school student living in Wisconsin with my mom. From the outside, there's nothing out of the ordinary about us. Well, except that my mom's a vintage-holic. See, she in fact became a famous YouTuber for her 1950s lifestyle. Living like this was such a hassle, but that's what puts food on our table, so I had to put up with it. However, sometimes mom even insisted that I join in her videos, like today. Ugh. Not just that, whenever we went out together, she made me wear the cheesiest vintage dresses, so I wouldn't ruin her aesthetic. As a hip-hop dancer, it was torture. See? I sure look way better in these clothes. Oh dear, what are those awful threats? Here, try this. It's really the bee's knees. Bee's knees, she said? More like granny. Ah, so pretty! Auntie, you have such excellent taste. That's Daisy, my cousin, and also schoolmate. Who gets along much better with my mom? Jeez, I can't let this hideous dress go home with us. If you like this so much, why don't you just take it instead, Daisy? Mom then walked to the counter with some more tacky clothes, ready to pay, but... Gee, where did I put it? <sighs> Guess I'll come back another time. Oh, missing something, Mommy? It's okay, Mrs. Faye. You're a regular, so you can pay us next time. Wait, what? No! So, now I had to wear this ugly dress to the boring event mom was dragging me to. Because the more the merrier. On the way there, mom was talking a blue steak about how I should behave at the bash. When suddenly, huh? What now? Awesome! This must be the third time this hunk of junk has broken down this month! Isn't it fantastic? And we don't even have phones to call for help! L, I've told you. It'd be ridiculous to show up with smartphones while dressing like this. Besides, people used to live just fine without them. Stop relying on them so much. Trust me, some nobleman will soon come to our rescue. Stay here and wait all you want. 
I'm gonna go look for a garage. But I only managed a couple of steps before a fancy car pulled over, and an old man in a suit stepped out and offered to help. Turns out he's one of Mom's subscribers and even asked for a picture. Thank you so much for saving my chariot. You're the ginchiest. Gosh, here she goes again with her old-timey slangs. Eventually, we reached this Anceville, and as soon as we arrived, Mom immediately ran to her celeb friends and posed for photos, leaving me lost and confused. While I was trying to navigate through this madness, some whispering caught my attention. Isn't that Faye? She's so extra! I can't even get past the first five minutes of her videos! Oh yeah? And still, Mom <laughs> thought the whole world was her fan. I don't get why she wanted to be here with these fake people that much! I was not having any of that stuffy place, so I went outside to get some air. As I wandered along the street, I spotted a group of teenagers dancing to old school hip hop. This is right up my alley. But wait, ugh, this stupid dress. My jam is coming on though. So letting my adrenaline take over, I joined the crowd. Everyone seemed impressed and even made room for me to shine. Then one of them joined me. I was really feeling it when a familiar screeching voice startled me. Elle, what on earth are you doing? Agitate the gravel now. Then mom dragged me to the car and drove me straight home. Gringles, do you understand that if anyone sees you like that, the perfect image I've built all these years will be in ruins? Pfft, then don't drag me into these things, do it alone! Mind your manners, you should find something more practical rather than dancing like those good-for-nothing lazy bums. I'd had enough. Furious, I stormed into my room and stayed there all night. The next morning, I woke up to the rumbling sound of an empty stomach. When the coast was clear, I went downstairs to check the fridge for food. Ew, what's that rotten egg smell? Jesus, this fridge must be from Napoleon times! I reluctantly went for an instant soup, but the microwave wouldn't even heat it up. And guess what? My mom spent over $500 just for this thing's useless 50s look. Then I decided to put on a movie to blow off some steam. But the ancient TV wouldn't turn on either. Unbelievable! Is there anything in this rusty dollhouse that actually works? I need to get out of here before going insane. Oh, there's a new family moving in next door. Hang on, isn't that the guy I was dancing with last night? He smiled and waved at me, but I could only force a smile and nodded back. Hey, why the long face? If you're bored, come give me a hand. Then he dragged me over to his yard before I could reply. Once we're done, we rested on the front porch. Turns out his name was Royce. He'd just moved in with his dad and had enrolled at my school. I have to admit, he's quite the charmer, and within minutes, I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my unconventional life with mom. My mom has way too much free time. I wish she'd find a man. Only then she might quit nagging me. Meanwhile, my dad is always busy. If he had someone by his side, he'd want to spend more time with his family and be less of a workaholic. Wait a minute. So, how about we make them... A, a couple? couple! Today is the day. Our parents have really tight schedules, so planning out this date took a lot of effort. But so far, so good. I told my mom to check out this vintage-themed restaurant in town while Royce told his dad that he wanted some father-son bonding time. Then, oops, we accidentally bump into each other and join tables. Look at my mom, gracefully fixing her hair and acting all charming. <laughs> I winked at Royce and then we made an excuse to leave the table so the adults could have some private time. It's been a little while. Let's see how the two are doing. Goodness gracious, was Mr. Phillips slurping on the spaghetti? He's making a mess and mom seemed really embarrassed. We immediately rushed inside to save this date before it's too late. At the end of the evening, we thought the worst was behind us. Mr. Phillips walked out without holding the door open for mom, making it swing back in her face. Gosh, every beginning is difficult, I guess. <sighs> Over the next few days, Royce and I beat our brains out to try and find a way to save their budding relationship, and came down to this. Mom, I twisted my ankle during practice. Can you please pick me up? Hey, Dad, I forgot my wallet at the practice room. Could you pick it up on the way home? Then we waited until our parents showed up and went inside to lock the door and even turn off the lights for dramatic effect. I immediately heard my mom's horrified scream. Then the room went quiet. I bet Mr. Phillips calmed her down. We waited a few minutes before calling the security guard to open the door, but contrary to our expectations, the one being hysterical was 
Mr. Phillips, who was now <laughs> sobbing in my mother's arms. Wait, what? Turns out Royce forgot that his dad, who always sleeps with the light on, is in fact nyctophobic. There goes plan B. This was bad. Everything kept going south and the clock was ticking as Royce's dad had to leave for another business trip soon. We can't accept defeat like this. There must be something your dad's really good at, right? I don't know, he's good at fixing stuff. Ha! <laughs> then we know what to do next. While mom was taking a shower, I waited for my plan to set in motion. Three, two, one. Ah! Elle, help me! I ran over to her to see water shooting out from a broken faucet. After a couple of minutes of struggle, I called Royce's house for help, aka Mr. Phillips. As soon as he arrived, he went straight into the bathroom and helped mom out of that pool. He looked way too cool, just like Superman. Now, time for his forte to speak up. As expected, he fixed it all in a blink, and mom even invited the two of them to stay for dinner as a thank you. Great! During dinner, Mr. Phillips kept praising my mom's cooking. He admitted that this coziness reminded him of the good old days. Seeing things escalate between them, Royce and I finished quickly and excused ourselves to give them some time alone. My dad's right. I can't remember the last time we sat together, as a family. Then he told me that his parents divorced a few years back, and due to his dad's work, they were always moving from place to place, which really wore him out. Seeing his sad gaze made me feel so bad for him. I just wanted to give him a hug. Hold on, what nonsense was I thinking? I immediately brushed off that weird thought, and we chatted until late. The next day at school, I was talking to Royce as usual, when suddenly our conversation was interrupted. Oh my god, aren't you the new guy? How do you know him? Huh? Where did Daisy come from? And is befriending Royce something strange? Then she whispered to me that Royce's good looks hadn't gone unnoticed by other students. Wow, no wonder I kept feeling like we were being watched whenever we hung out at school. Daisy then proceeded to chime in between us and talk to Royce non-stop, even on our way home, when clearly her house was not in the same direction as ours. How annoying! But good news, back at home mom seemed to be floating on air. I caught her humming along to love songs and she didn't nag me at all when I went to dance practice. Royce also said that his dad had been in a great mood too. Sparks were definitely flying between them. Our plan finally worked. Good job, sis. Uh huh? Was I really gonna be his stepsister? I should be happy with this outcome, right? But what was this uneasy feeling? One day at practice, I walked in on Daisy and Royce and immediately felt awkward, so I just rolled myself into a corner. Why did I react that way seeing them be so close? Is it possible that I've fallen for him? This can't be. We're gonna be family. There's no way this can happen. After that day, I tried to avoid Royce. Despite his new girl, he still bothered me, but I kept my distance. I was brooding all the way home until I heard my mom talking on the phone as I entered the house. And I'll bake you some pecan pie, darling. Wait a minute, Royce and his dad were both allergic to pecan, so who's she being all lovey-dovey with? The next day, as usual, I told my mom I'd go to practice, but actually lingered outside the house to stalk on mom. I saw her on the couch, video calling some strange man. Oh gosh, did my mom really cheat on Royce's dad? How could she? Still in shock, I glumly lurked to Graffiti Alley and spotted Royce and Daisy there. They seem to be talking about something really serious. So, you already knew? Yeah, ages ago. But it's clear that we can't just force love on someone. So, you mean to just give up and happily watch them see other people? Oh no, so they knew mom was unfaithful to Mr. Phillips already? How embarrassing. Right at that moment, Daisy spotted me, so I frantically ran away. After school the following day, Daisy wanted to talk with me in private. However, it was not about what happened yesterday. Do me a favor and stop hovering around Royce all the time, will you? But Royce is my friend. I can't just stop seeing him because you said so. If you like him, be my guest. Suddenly, Daisy fell to the ground. Ouch! Why did you push me? Huh? What is she doing? At that exact moment, Royce showed up and worriedly checked on her. Okay, now I know what's going on. Sorry about that. Let me give you a hand. When she was just about to stand up, I shoved her. Now you know what my real push feels like. I noticed Roy's stunned look, but just walked off. Now that I don't seem so great in his eyes anymore, he'll stop approaching me. Sweetie, what's wrong? What's wrong? This is all your fault! If you didn't cheat on Mr. Phillips, everything would be fine! What do you mean? Cheating on whom? 
Then my mom <laughs> burst out laughing after I told her. Turns out they never dated. They both saw through our matchmaking plan early on, but decided to just be good friends. And the person I saw mom video calling with was her boyfriend, but she hadn't introduced him yet because they'd only started dating. But why set us up in the first place? Finally, I had the chance to tell her how I truly felt about being forced into her vintage world and not being able to pursue my love for street dancing. Mom was quiet for a second and then said, Gee, how silly I've been. I've been inspiring strangers to go after their dreams, but I stopped my own daughter from pursuing hers. I felt so much better after pouring my heart out. I also mentioned Royce's situation with his dad and she promised to talk to him about it. Hang on, this means... Mom, so you and Mr. Phillips are just friends, right? Immediately, I ran off to find Royce. As if on cue, the doorbell rang and it was... Daisy! What game is she playing now? If she's here to mess around, come at me already. But surprisingly, Daisy apologized. I'm sorry, I was just blinded by jealousy. And there is nothing going on between me and Royce. He in fact already rejected me the day you saw us at the graffiti alley. Also, he asked me to give you this. I opened the box to see an adorable keychain with I love you on it. Oh my, is, is this a love confession? But there's also a note saying, I'm leaving for another city, till we meet again. No, no, no! I sprinted to his house right away. Oh lord, he's already packing! Without thinking, I hugged him and started sobbing. So, you read my message? Y yeah And what do you think? I, I feel the same, but you're leaving for real? Then, his smile turned playful, and he admitted he was just messing with me. Turns out he was going away, but only for a few days, for a dance competition. Really? That's awesome! But I can't forgive you for tricking me yet. So, yeah. Although we couldn't get our parents together, us two actually became a couple, so our matchmaking scheme isn't a total failure, right? <laughs> we were even able to change a few things for the better. For instance, Mom spoke to Royce's dad, and he agreed not to move for the time being so his son could settle in. Mom also promised to check in on him when his dad's away on business. As for our family, my mom no longer tried so hard to act like she's not living in 2023. She now sometimes includes modern elements in her vlogs as well, and I even become a regular <laughs> guest on her channel. Hey Beans, today my fiancé and I are baking this fab coconut cake, along with my daughter and our boyfriend. They are hip-hop dancers! Check out their channel if that's something you fancy! They're really the cat's pajamas! Hey, I'm Connor, and I'm currently taking a well-deserved break from studying to hang out with my friends. I go to college at the Georgia Institute of Tech and I'm sure to be a top-notch architect one day soon. Now I just have one thing to deal with, then I can properly enjoy my night off. Oh, here she is. Connor, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to hurt you, but sorry. We should stop seeing each other. Ah, well, every ending is a new beginning. <laughs> Cheers. I was the master of getting girlfriends I'm tired of to break up with me. It was great. As this way, no one could ever accuse me of being a bad boy. <sighs> what to do now? I reluctantly had to find a new challenge then. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to turn this in. Um, that's okay. Just trying to find one more paper. Uh, um, what's your name? <laughs> I'm Connor. Hi. Hmm, her sparkling eyes, her shiny hair, her soft hands. But ugh, why was suddenly some nerd dragging me away from the hot girl and into a corner? Before I could ask him what was going on, he started waving a photo of this girl in my face. So it turns out this dude is called Patrick, and the girl in the photo is Paige, his girlfriend. Their parents are both influential sorts and organize their whole engagement. Sounds great, right? I mean, she's pretty cute. But no, he wanted me to find a way to make Paige break up with them. I've heard a lot about you. I, I need your help. I can't do this myself. <laughs> huh? Sure, I get it. A real man will never be the one to break up first. I might be able to help, but first, let's see what kind of person she is. The conversation started to become super serious. From the sound of it, this page girl was a genuine, good-natured girl with a vulnerable side. So this needed to be handled with extra care, so that there wouldn't be any awkward family provocations from my clients. Hmm, perhaps... Nah, this way wouldn't work. Neither would that way. I was about to give up when suddenly Patrick stacked a pack of money, approximately a thousand dollars, on the table. 
Help me, then it's all yours. Whoa, that was a lot of money to me. It would get me the magnificent PS5 of my dreams. Ah. <sighs> Besides, with my charm and handsome looks, I can make Paige fall in love with me and leave Patrick in no time. Genius! My debut had to be spectacular, so I looked online and hired some people pretending to be thugs to block Paige's path. Then I'd waltz in and rescue her. The plan was all set, so I leisurely walked to the rendezvous spot, but... Oh no! Who knew those guys were real thugs? They threatened us, asked us to hand over all our belongings, then forced us to go to some abandoned warehouse. Oh my god, the $1,000 was so not worth losing my life for. Yes, I was somewhat afraid, but my flirtatious instinct kicked in, and I turned to Paige and started talking to her. Oh man, she's super sweet. And I noticed that when she talks about something that interests her, she crinkles her nose. She's so cute, but most of all, she's really smart. Why, you ask? Because just an hour later, the cops showed up and arrested the thugs. Turns out, before Paige handed over her belongings, she quickly texted the thug's license plate to a friend and asked her to call the cops. Phew! And, luckily for me, thanks to this destiny meeting, I got a little more information about her and learned that Paige was planning to learn Spanish to major in tourism there. But there's one more important thing. That is, I think, I have a crush on her. She's not like any other girl I've met before. I want to win her heart, truly, not just because of the plan. It will be the best of both worlds. Patrick gets to be free of Paige, as requested, but she won't end up a lovelorn girl because she'll have a new handsome boyfriend by her side. Yep, that'll be me. <laughs> there was just one problem. In all the commotion of the day, I'd forgotten to ask Paige for her number. Oops. I had asked Patrick for it and then texted her, but sadly didn't receive a response. Hmm. I needed to be smart about this, so I decided to pretend to be a Spanish tutor. Yeah, I can't speak Spanish, but with my charm, that's no big deal, right? I created a flashy profile and told Patrick to pretend to surf and accidentally find me. Then show Paige. And so, ding! Hola, yo soy Professor Connor. But wait, sheesh! If only I'd studied Spanish harder in high school. And now the extent of my Spanish were just a few words I'd picked up from binge-watching Money Heist. So I just copied down Spanish lessons off YouTube and taught these to Paige. I don't know if it's because of my teaching skills or my charisma, but Paige seemed to think I was legit. <laughs> However, my flirting tricks weren't going so well. I knew she liked me. I mean, who wouldn't like me? Besides, she gave me these cute looks and laughed at my jokes. Our chemistry was undeniable. So when I reached over and placed my hand on top of hers, I felt sparks fly. But then she gave me this awkward look and moved her hand away. She liked me, right? So why was she acting like this? I never failed at flirting. Feeling frustrated, I was trudging my way up the street when, huh? Was that Patrick happily holding hands with a girl? I recognized the long hair. It was Paige. Ugh, why can't she drop her lousy boyfriend already? And why won't she date me instead? I was about to leave, but the more I thought about it, the more resentful I became. So I bribed a little boy to run up to Paige and say, Why aren't you with Connor, you cheater? Mean, huh? But haha, <laughs> Patrick would be pleased as he now had a legitimate excuse to break up with her anyway. But when the girl turned around, I realized that she wasn't Paige. The poor girl looked completely dumbfounded. Patrick started yelling at her and pulling on her arm so hard she almost fell over. Huh? Where's the nerd Patrick? And that wasn't cool at all. Then he raised his hand to hit her, but I zoomed in front of him. Stop! No reason to hit a woman, bro! Patrick immediately grabbed my collar. You dare play tricks with my Becky, huh? Seeing that, the shocked girl quickly ran away. No, no, I thought it was Paige, so I hired the boy just to give you an excuse to break up with her. Calm down, bro. Patrick reassessed the situation, then he cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> Oh, well, uh, I was bored of Becky anyway, thanks. I was still shocked by this jerky side of Patrick when he immediately said, uh, By the way, you can stop the plan with Paige. I decided I like her now. Lately, she's been so full of life and less clingy. He told me he would still pay me, then he hopped into a taxi. Ugh. That's the version of Paige when she's with me. I gave her that zest of life, you jerk. Whatever. From this day forth, he was no longer my client, and I didn't want his stupid money. <sighs> it was time I told Paige what Patrick was really like, so I arranged to meet her in a cafe and told her everything. But when she got over the initial shock, she snapped at me. I know this is all part of your twisted fabrication. I mean, you lied about speaking Spanish, and now you're just making up stories to break Patrick and me up. Then she threw my textbook back at me and stormed off. 
Oh man, that Patrick is such a slimeball. But I couldn't blame her for believing him over me. I'd seen firsthand how much of a wolf in sheep's clothing he was. I tried to find proof to show Paige, but that jerk sure covered his tracks. His whole nerdy bookworm facade was flawless. And he was still this sluggish nerd, wobbly clutching the bus handle to go to school every day. Ugh, what a con man. Just you wait, Patrick. It's time the world saw your true face. With such determination, I continued to spy on him around town. Then one time, like every other day, I was on duty when a group stopped me, accompanied by Patrick pointing at me. Here's our sandbag! Uh Uh-oh, looks like I was busted. The whole group gathered around me, fists ready. Yeah, I was pretty terrified. There's no way I could fight off a group this size. I raised my fists and prepared for pain, but then someone shouted, Stop! It was Paige. Suddenly, Patrick immediately changed his attitude and ordered the group to leave. He told Paige that I stole his stuff and his friends were helping him get it back. What? The swine! Connor isn't a thief, I know it for sure. There must be some misunderstanding. Please don't accuse him like that. Patrick's face changed. He grabbed Paige's hand and pulled her away, saying, We're getting engaged at the end of this month. Say no more. Okay, so I may have gate-crashed their engagement party, but I did hide at the back while the speeches were going on. Then to my surprise, as Patrick was talking, they both spotted me. Then Paige turned to him and shook her head. It hurt to see her like this. Perhaps she changed her mind. What do you mean? Is this because of Connor? Paige kept quiet, while Patrick's parents were furious. How dare you cheat on my son? Who do you think you are? Paige, why is this happening? Really, Paige, say something. Feeling the pressure and injustice of it all, poor Paige looked distraught as she desperately tried to hold back her tears. I really couldn't stand seeing her like that, so I jumped out of the crowd to come to her defense. Everyone calm down. Paige is the sweetest, most amazing girl, and she deserves better than this jerk. Don't listen to him. He's a thief and a fiancé stealer. I was done listening to this guy's slander. So I threw a punch straight at his smug face. Yeah, the engagement party had sure turned chaotic. I looked at the wreckage in front of me the consequences that I had caused. Okay, so maybe coming here wasn't my best idea. Actually, this was all my fault for ever agreeing to help Patrick in the first place. Or I shouldn't have been a jerk in the first place. Feeling deflated, I arrived home and saw that I'd received a message from Paige. My heart thudded as I opened it. Thank you for everything and try to practice your Spanish as it's even worse than mine. Goodbye. And that was the last text she sent me. After that, I spent a month trying to contact her, but received no reply. So finally, I plucked up my courage to go to Paige's house, and was told that she'd left for Spain earlier than scheduled. Perhaps the shock was so huge that Paige wanted to leave this place as soon as possible. It was all my fault. I was the biggest jerk in this story, and now I'd lost the girl. Alas, vengeance is bliss. So I walked inside, went straight to Patrick's table, where he was wasted in the arms of a bunch of girls took a picture, and sent it to his family. What is done by night appears by day, my friend. A few days later, I heard that after being exposed, Patrick's parents had confiscated all of his bank cards. Even his current girlfriend dumped him. Ha! So that sealed the final breakup deal for my special guest. And now, guess where I'm at? Looking for the girl of my life, duh. And this time, I'm going to make sure I don't screw it up. Sir, we're looking for the nearest landing point. Our helicopter has lost two engines. Mayday! 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 Jetfly 457! Do you know who I am? I am Mr. Anderson's daughter. I insist you find a way to save us immediately! Poof! Money isn't gonna save you now. The best thing to do is be quiet and pray. No! It can't end like this! I tried raising my phone to pick up a signal, but the blade hit my hand causing it to tumble onto the ground and the screen to shatter. Stop this nonsense. Nonsense? Actually, I'm trying to get us out of this mess, but all you're doing is just sitting there. Before I could finish my sentence, Blade blurted out, for God's sake, then jumped out of the pilot seat, put on a large backpack, and turned to me. Get ready to parachute out. What? Are you serious? No way I'm gonna do that. That's the only way out. Suit yourself, else I don't mind jumping alone either. Oh my god, he's a jerk. Fine, but first thing I'm doing when I get home is getting Daddy to fire him. 
then Blade moved us towards the door. Ah! The sky was so fast and perilous! I took a deep breath. It's about time. Am I still alive? I turned to my left and saw Blade lying right next to me. Oh, from this angle, he looks kind of handsome. But wait, why wasn't he moving? Oh my god, is he? I sat up and shook him vigorously. You can't be dead! You must get me out of here! You haven't given me a chance to fire you! Shush. Turn the volume down, will ya? Oh god, you're awake. Take me home at once. I want to go home, not this disgusting place. You're the one who insisted on flying with me in the first place. Ahem, <clears throat> that's not how you talk to your mistress. He rolled his eyes at me and muttered under his breath. Oof, please. You're not my mistress. You're just my employee's spoiled daughter. Can you believe the cheek of that man? Ugh! Anyway, I'm Maya, the beloved daughter of the CEO of Ander X Corp. And that jerk is Blade, my father's private pilot. I don't know why my father likes him so much. He's sarcastic, abrupt, and crude. The only reason I was flying with him in the first place was because he was going to pick my father up from a meeting in Rio, which coincidentally, I was in need of a weekend getaway under the hot tropical sunlight. So two birds, one stone, huh? But yeah, this is what I got instead. Oops, how embarrassing. Why was my stomach growling like this? Hearing that, Blade immediately opened his backpack and took out a sandwich. I reached out to take it, but what? He stuffed it straight into his mouth and grinned at me as he chewed. Fine, he could keep his lame food. At that moment, we heard a loud noise in the sky. We looked up and saw a rescue helicopter. I jumped up and down, waved and shouted to catch its attention. After a while, I turned around and saw Blade doing something weird. What on earth are you doing? Come here and shout! Now is not the time to build tiny stick houses or whatever, mister. But he just rolled his eyes and carried on. How dare he? I jumped in and kicked hard at the pile of twigs he was stacking. Jeez, he sure looked annoyed. Why are you looking at me like that? It's you who keeps doing all that nonsense this time. Your shouts are useless here. This fire was our only chance of sending that helicopter a distress signal. And you just ruined it. Then he stormed off, leaving me all alone. So the rescue helicopter flew away, and our survival journey continued, unfortunately. Hey, slow down. How long does it take to this stupid brook? And guess what he said to me? We only have one bottle of water, so if you don't want to die of thirst, I suggest you shut up and keep walking. Blah, blah, blah. But we went on and on and on and still couldn't find the brook even though the sun had already set. So we had to create a makeshift tent with our parachute and the two of us gradually fell asleep. Early the next morning, a raging hunger awakened me. Blade was still sleeping, so I crept past him and rummaged in his backpack. Oh, the jerk was hiding an apple from me. I was about to take a big bite out of it, when suddenly a hand snatched it away. Ugh! I can't stand it anymore! It's just an apple! Why do you... Huh? When did Blade get so hairy? Wait, was it... A monkey? Ah! I screamed loudly, and the monkey ran away with my breakfast. Blade rushed over to me. You know what, princess? That was the only food we had left. Then he pulled my hand to chase after the monkey. And guess what we found? O-M-G. There was our helicopter next to the brook. We were so happy that we ran over and hugged each other tightly. We were alive! And we have enough food for a week in there. Oh, wait. He was still on my blacklist, so I immediately pushed him away. He scratched his head, and his face turned as red as a tomato. Hmm. I suppose he was kinda adorable sometimes, but I was still mad at him. As the days passed by, 
we started running low on food. Blade remained persistent and continued trying to make contact on the radio. Finally, he detected the frequency and... Eek! We got a reply! They told us to wait a little longer, and the next morning a helicopter would come to the rescue. At last, this was our last night in this awful place. Blade was so cold and unpleasant at the beginning, but over the past difficult days, he seemed to have opened his heart and really showed his warm side. We actually spent hours chatting that night, and I listened to him talk about his tough childhood in the orphanage and his dream of flying freely in the sky. Well, that's great! I wish I had a dream to dedicate myself to. Oh, you don't have any? Actually, yes. Since my mom passed away, my father started working even more. I longed to have my happy family life back, but it wasn't to be. Maybe I will get that again, but this time with my fiancé. Really? If so, he's a lucky guy. Huh? What did Blade mean by that? I suddenly felt my face flush. Honestly, speaking of my fiancé, I just found out by accident that the luxurious life he claims to have, all the houses and cars, are all fake. I'm a bit confused, but I haven't asked him directly yet. Just like that, our stories continued until dawn. Ugh, oh, thank goodness, I'm finally out of that awful forest! Maya, Maya, are you okay? I've been worried sick about you. Ch- Chase? Oh, you two know each other? Chase is my fiancé. Uh, um, it's a long story, but I'll tell you later. Now let's get going. That night, we stayed at a hotel before heading home. And oh boy, it sure was good to be pampered again. I was sitting in our suite room, picking up my room service order and waiting for Chase. Hmm... What was taking him so long? Feeling down being all alone, I found myself leaving the room and looking for Blade. As I was walking along the hallway, I accidentally bumped into a room service guy and caused him to drop his walkie-talkie. Watch it. Don't mess it up. Hmm. That sounded a lot like... Nah, it can't be. What made my mistress come all the way over to my room? Um... About the things I told you yesterday, regarding Chase, I didn't realize you knew him, so please keep it a secret. Maya, actually I think you need to know this. Suddenly his phone rang, so he answered it. The conversation sounded serious. Then he said to me, The airport cameras have been checked and someone tampered with the helicopter. They're going to send me the footage. We both watched the video and saw a strange young man approaching it before takeoff. Hang on, I recognized that man. He's the room service guy I just bumped into. Uh-oh, I had a bad feeling about this. We need to find him now. Huh? What was that smell? Ew, it was irritating my nose. I asked Blade if he smelt it too and he just shrugged and said all he could smell was my perfume. Then there was a clicking sound at the door. We rushed over to it, but... It was jammed. Blade called the front desk, but no one answered. So I took the phone off him and called my room, in the hope Chase would pick up. But he didn't. I started coughing. There was definitely a weird smell in here. So I rushed into the bathroom, soaked the towels, and passed one to Blade to cover his mouth and nose with. Then I grabbed the vase off the table and threw it at the window. Smash! Wow, nice shot! Luckily, we were only on the second floor, so with Blade's help, we easily jumped onto the ground. Then we rushed to reception to verify the identity of the suspicious hotel staff, and ran straight into... Chase! Are you two okay? What's with the gas leak? Chase worriedly asked us, then he turned to scold the hotel manager. Huh? How did he know about that? Blade and I shared confused looks, but neither of us said anything out loud. It was horrible, Chase. I was so scared. Please stay with me. I don't want to be alone. I pretended to cry as I leaned on his shoulder. Then, while Chase was talking to reception, I turned to Blade and asked him to call the police to find the suspicious hotel staff instead. That afternoon, before checking out, 
the police called to say they'd arrested the suspect. So all three of us went to the station. As soon as the police led the room service guy out, he immediately pointed at Chase and said, He's the one who hired me. Chase gave a shocked look, denied the accusation, and threatened to sue him if he continued with this slander. Stop the act, Chase. I checked and I know you used my card to send huge payments to the same person, that person. All I did was love you with all of my heart. So why did you try and harm me? No, I never wanted you to be hurt. It's just, I, why were you always with him? What do you mean? I hate you, Blade. Why do you always stick your nose in my business and ruin everything? I'd almost reached my goal. Then you appeared and messed everything up. So, it turns out Chase was targeting Blade, not me. The two of them grew up in the same orphanage. As a kid, Chase was a crafty boy who took delight in deceiving others for fun. So the nuns assigned Blade the task of watching over him. Blade just wanted the best for his friend, so he followed Chase's every step and tried to stop him from all his petty theft plans and love scams. So Chase grew to despise Blade, and when they both left the orphanage, they lost contact with each other. Coincidentally, one time, when Chase arrived at my home to pick me up, he saw Blade. So fearing that he'd expose his underprivileged background, he planned to get rid of him forever. I don't care how much money you have, I already know your flashy wealth was all made up, but I thought you had your reasons and weren't comfortable enough to tell the truth. But it didn't matter, as I still wanted to be with you. However, what I find unacceptable is your deceitful and cruel nature. I never want to see you ever again. I burst into tears, and Blade comforted me. As for Chase, he was still begging for me to forgive him as the police dragged him away. It took me a long time to come to terms with what Chase did, but luckily for me, I have Blade to look out for me. Yep, that's right. We're now an official couple. Finally, I have the kind, loyal, action man boyfriend of my dreams. We sure do make a good couple, don't you think? Hi, I'm Donna, an influencer extraordinaire and soon-to-be supermodel. My family are my biggest supporters. Look, there's my sister Charlotte. Even though my parents are busy running the family corporation, they buy me whatever I want. This includes this spectacular dress for the upcoming Elite Model Look Contest. Girls, get ready! We're eating out tonight! Yay! Charlotte just helped Dad secure another business contract, so it's time to celebrate! At the restaurant, Mom, Dad, and Charlotte walked ahead while I showed my 329,587 followers around. My fans even commented that I should compete for Miss USA. Suddenly, someone bumped into me, causing me to drop my phone. Oh no! My live stream's ended, and it's all his fault! Idiot, you ruined my live stream! Now my fans will think I'm rude and unfollow me. Are you walking with your eyes closed? Sorry, I didn't mean to. Let me make it up for you. Donna the Fabulous? Okay, you've just got one more follower. What a jinx! He better stay out of my sight. But as soon as I reached our table, I saw his face again. Why is he here? Donna, this is Matthew, our new finance director. Oh, how important. But not as much as live streaming, right? Who does he think he is? Charlotte even <laughs> laughed at his stupid joke. Speaking of which, Donna, you're going to study business from now on. Time to stop those modeling live streaming things. What? But why? You've always supported my dreams before. But dad just ignored me and chatted with Matthew. Dad was being so unreasonable. Everything was fine until that Matthew guy showed up. Charlotte comforted me and suggested we attend business classes for me while I prepared for the modeling contest. What a brilliant idea! Oh, I love my amazing quick-witted sister! I then put all of my focus into practicing for the contest, but Matthew kept on disturbing me with his nonsense. He even sent me a picture of wedding rings saying, Are these okay? Think they'll match us? I frantically called him to ask him what all the gibberish was about. Hasn't your dad told you yet? We're getting engaged and taking charge of the company together. What on earth is this guy saying? 
Since when was I expected to marry some guy I barely knew and take over a business I had no interest in? Dad should have some explanation for this. Upon arriving home, I confronted Dad, but he just sighed and said he was planning on telling me himself. But you can't just dictate my career and who I marry! Donna, I only want the best for you. But Dad, Donna didn't even attend her business classes and is still indulging in her nonsense fashion club. How can you expect her to handle the company? Oh no, why is she telling him that? Was she trying to help me? She's right, Dad. I have no interest in business at all. I can't. If that's the case, then you can start as vice president and get some hands-on experience. And you, Charlotte, you'll be Donna's personal assistant and support her. No! This is not how you want it to turn out. Dad used to love us both, but now he didn't even listen. Ugh, yes, Charlotte, my savior. She would surely know what to do. I can't believe it. I've tried so hard to prove myself, only to have everything given to a simple-minded fool like you. S simple minded That's what you really think of me? Well, I guess I just gotta take my new position to show her how simple-minded I am then. So the next morning, I dolled up and strutted to the company lobby under a different name, Miss Vice President. Ha! Huh, look at those gawking eyes wishing they could escape from the boring suits. Matthew was there too, and... Was he <laughs> laughing? Suddenly, my heel got tangled up in my dress and I tripped over. What a disaster. Matthew offered me his hand and asked if I was okay. Who needs his help? And all the silly chatters? Just wait and see. And by that, I mean now. Matthew introduced me to the company's core members and announced some new strategic goals for the company. ROI, margin, accounts. Jeez, what kind of language is he speaking? After what seemed like an eternity, he asked if anyone wanted to add anything. Aha! Uh -huh. I, of course, couldn't miss a chance to show my leadership. This office is seriously lacking some colors. Violet blinds would be a good start, and some motivational pictures really help boost productivity. Oh, you mean putting up motivational quotes? Oh, please, no. Motivation comes from the all-time fashion greats. You know, Bella Hadid, Tyra Banks, Kendall Jenner. Everyone gawped at me while Charlotte furiously signaled me to stop. Everyone here is so boring. Ugh, all right, I'll stop then. My first day was then followed by tedious meetings and schedules. Everyone was talking gibberish and making me sign a bunch of papers. But every cloud has a silver lining. And for a foodie like me, that's dinner meetings. These people really know how to enjoy life, don't they? But before I could even have my first bite, they all started asking me about proposal this and project that. Fortunately, Matthew was there to save the day. Honestly, he seems pretty good at his job, and he's quite attractive when focused. Oh yeah, work. I gotta contribute my own talents at work too. So, the next day I put the sign on my door, then sat back and watched my favorite fashion show. Ooh, look at those dazzling dresses! One day, I'd be walking the runway in a gown like that, not sitting here surrounded by confusing numbers and papers. Later, when I opened the door, an endless line of people was already waiting for me. Jeez, can't this company with all these brilliant brains function without me? Right then, Charlotte came dragging me away. What happened? Oh gosh, I didn't know that my computer was connected to the meeting room's projector, so everyone had been watching Project Runaway with me. Matthew was in the conference room too. Why didn't he fix it? Okay, everyone. We should thank our cute boss for giving us a lot of ideas for our problems. He finished the meeting and let them out, but Charlotte was still standing there fuming at me. Cute? There is nothing cute about it. Don't get any wrong ideas that he likes you. Wait for me, Maddie. What is with that attitude? Oh, right. I've seen the gooey-eyed look she gives Matthew. Does she have feelings for him? Before I could pry further, I was sent to Millen for another stupid meeting. Feeling bored, I watched a fashion show to kill time when someone startled me from my side. I personally think this collection is overrated. Oh, sorry if I scared you. I'm Brian. He then gave me his business card and wow, he's the CEO of a modeling firm in France. Are you coming to the fashion week too? I wish. I actually came for work. <sighs> oh, what a pity. There's a modeling contest this week. I can tell a true beauty like you is destined for the crown. I missed so many chances to be on the runway. If I make it this time, maybe mom and dad will see how serious I am about modeling. This is too amazing of an offer to refuse. Brian, I'm coming with you. At the show, I made sure my phone was off so I could truly immerse myself in all the glamour of the newest fall collection. Brian then kept his word and took me to the audition. I was super nervous at first, but 
Unexpectedly, everyone else looked so amateur. Meanwhile, I strutted like a pro, confident that this time I would get an offer. But for now, reality was calling. <sighs> As soon as I turned on my phone, a zillion missed calls from Dad and Matthew popped up. This screamed trouble, so I quickly got Brian's contacts and returned home. There, Charlotte went all banshee shrieking mode on me, accusing me of being irresponsible and selfish for skipping the important meeting. Dad, if you don't do something about this, Donna will destroy the company you've worked so hard to build. That's right. But instead of yelling at her, you should have been there to help out. I'm so disappointed in you, Charlotte. Oh God, Charlotte's face turned pale immediately. Dad should be scolding me, not her. Feeling a little bad for Charlotte, the next day I went to talk to her, but it sounded like she was arguing with someone inside. I walked in to see Matthew sitting there with loads of pictures of Brian and me. We're still, in Charlotte's words, it looked like we were dating. A few photos can't change the fact that we're getting engaged. He then grabbed my hand and pulled me outside, leaving a stunned Charlotte behind. How are you so sure that I'm not seeing someone else? It's just a feeling, or maybe it's just my hope because I... What did he mean by hope? And holy shrimp, why is my heart beating so crazy? What a day. I thought it was finally over when dad slammed the pictures of me and Brian down in front of me. He was so mad at me, he decided our engagement would be tomorrow instead of a month, as planned. But I haven't mentally prepared for this. So here I am, at my engagement ceremony, waiting for my fiancé to arrive. <laughs> just kidding. Actually, Brian called me last minute to tell me the best news ever. A fashion brand had chosen me as their ambassador. I needed to fly over for some paperwork. Thanks to him, I successfully escaped the engagement and flew to Milan to meet up with him. Finally, I got to pursue my long repressed dream in my favorite city and not pay heed to my dad's ridiculous orders. Yay! As I woke up the next morning, I eagerly reached for my phone to call Brian, but huh? Where was it? I looked at the nightstand, but my passport, my wallet, and all of my stuff had disappeared. I dashed to the reception asking for Brian's room, but they all shook their heads saying there was no one by that name staying there. Frantic, I used their computer and checked the website for his phone number but it kept saying error. Then I look up any information about the contest, but found Zilch. How could he do this to me? I trusted him. Now I'm in a foreign country, all alone, and with no money. What am I gonna do? I can't just call dad to come get me, and neither can I call Charlotte. There's only one person I could contact right now. So I called Matthew, and he flew over immediately. We were walking along the Navili Canal to get some dinner before heading back. I thought he would be furious right now because I ran away from our engagement, but he was just quiet the whole time. So, is it okay for you to suddenly come here? I mean, work and stuff, you know? It's alright, you come first, everything else comes after. That's sweet of him, but I needed to make sure he didn't get the wrong message. I called for your help, but that doesn't mean I want to get engaged. I'm... I'm not ready to come in. At first, I wanted this marriage to happen, but now I'm not so sure anymore. Oh my... Did me running away from the engagement upset him that much? As we stepped through the door, I saw mom, dad, and Charlotte waiting for us. Charlotte instantly bombarded me with her dolphin frequency yelling, saying how much they worried about me, how irresponsible and terrible I was. You should have won an Oscar for your acting, Charlotte. Unfortunately, your partner played you this time. Acting? And what partner? Turns out Charlotte was the one behind all of this. She hired Brian from the beginning to make me look bad in my parents' eyes. She also made sure my engagement with Matthew didn't go as planned. Everything played out just as she'd wanted, but she didn't think Brian's greed would get the best of him. He called Matthew, saying he was holding me for ransom. And during the call, the idiot fraud accidentally brought up Charlotte. We were all too shook to even speak when Charlotte burst out crying. You're right, it was me all along. She's never done anything useful, yet got everything meant for me. Mom, Dad, if you needed someone to take care of the company and marry Maddie, why her? Why not me? You haven't told them anything this whole time? I was still processing everything when my dad sighed and said, I was going to tell you both when the time felt right, but seeing you pitting against each other like this hurts me so much. Actually, Donna, we're not your biological parents. Turns out, Dad was my parents' private lawyer and the company belonged to my real parents, not to Dad. But then, my parents got into a terrible accident and during their last minutes, they gave the company and me over to him. They asked Dad to raise me properly and arrange for me to marry Matthew as a part of their deal with Matthew's parents. 
Growing up and seeing me so passionate about modeling, Dad was gonna let Charlotte run the company and let me live my life how I wanted to. But then Matthew and his family showed up and insisted we get engaged according to the deal. Dad had no choice but to respect them and carry out my parents' will. So, my current beloved mom and dad are not my actual family? Worse still, my biological parents had both passed away. Donna, we hope you understand. Though we're not related, we have always loved you as our daughter. This is very hard for us too. I looked at mom and dad, the ones who had always loved and cared for me. Mom, dad, just like you two. I'm sure my parents would want me to do what makes me happy. Though I am the lawful heiress of the company, I can only do harm to it. So I hope you understand and let Charlotte take over it. She's a better suit than me. That's right. You cannot force someone into doing something they don't like. Neither can you force someone into love. Woohoo! No more boring office job. Instead, I've put all my energy into elite model look. And here I am today. You've got this, Donna. I confidently strutted down the runway with Mom, Dad, and Charlotte cheering from the audience. And when I finished my part, I joined my family and nervously waited for the MC to announce the chosen ones. Samantha Friske, Amelia Davis, and Donna Rossi! Yes! I've made it! I've been waiting for this day for so long! Suddenly, I spotted Matthew coming towards us. Congratulations, Donna. I knew you'd get it. Thank you for coming. I know love cannot be forced, nor should I rush it, but... Whenever you're ready, Donna, will you go out with me? How about... now? Ugh! Look at them flirting! What an eyesore! But don't get it wrong, trust me, this is no happy family. That woman there isn't my mom. She's Rochelle, our housemaid. I repeat, housemaid! But it looks like she has her sights set on becoming my stepmom. Ugh. We only hired her because after my mom passed away, Dad and I struggled to deal with our grief. And our clumsiness as well. So tidying the house didn't take priority. I suppose Rochelle was an okay maid. Can't deny that she's a good cleaner. And her cooking is tasty. However, recently, I've noticed that she always cooks Dad's favorite meals. Also, they laugh and flirt and constantly give each other these gooey-eyed looks. Yuck! Today, she even took out her handkerchief and attentively wiped my dad's sweaty forehead. Who does she think she is? She definitely wanted to hypnotize dad. If she thought she'd have a slot in this house, she was totally wrong. I needed to do something about this. I had to talk to dad right away. Dad, mom didn't pass away that long ago but it looks like you've already lined up her replacement. Didn't you hurt mom enough by reconnecting with your ex right before she died? What do you mean replacement? Brittany, you're being childish and unreasonable. I don't know and I don't care, but I want Rochelle to get out of our house immediately. She's for sure trying to get something out of you. Okay, fine, if you insist, but make sure you find a new housemaid to replace her. Ugh. So it turns out that finding a new maid who's actually good is nearly impossible. Dozens of people came to try out, but none of them were as considerate as Rochelle. Okay, after all, we still needed a maid. So I reluctantly let Rochelle stay until I found someone new. This didn't mean I was going to let my annoyance for her slide. I decided that while I was stuck in the same house as her, I may as well play some tricks on her to let out my anger. When she decided to cook, again, the divine chicken soup that my dad loved so much, I kindly added a little salt to make it more savory. But somehow, my dad still praised her delicious food. He must just be flattering her, right? So I tried it for myself. What? How could she do that? It tasted amazing. Ugh. Another time, I copied this trick I saw on TikTok by sticking layers of food wrap on Rochelle's door, then acting like there was an emergency. Quick, the oven is making weird noises. I think something's burning. Rochelle quickly ran out of the room and I couldn't help but laugh my head off. Her face was really funny. She then gave me this bewildered look and smiled helplessly. Ugh, why did this woman never get mad? Okay then, let's step it up a notch. 
I decided to play the ultimate trick. Knowing that Rochelle was scared to death of cockroaches, I cut a cockroach shape out of paper and put it behind the fabric of her nightlight. That night, I was dozing off when I heard a screechy scream, ah, coming from Rochelle's room. Aha, success. But she was so terrified that she fainted. Oops. Do you know what the most annoying thing is? Even after all the trouble I've caused her, Rochelle was still super sweet to me. She was always offering me cookies and asking me about my day and stuff. I felt like she was trying to play the role of a mother, and I didn't like that at all. She couldn't fool me. I knew she only put up with me to please my dad. Thanks to Rochelle, I could never be at ease, even in my own home. But recently, a very special person has come into my life and lit up my mood. It was totally by chance. That day, it had rained like crazy, so there were puddles everywhere. I was on my way home from the grocery store when a car drove whizzing by. I thought I was going to get a free bath, but then suddenly, an arm pulled me back and shielded me with his body, just like in a romantic movie. Standing there was a boy, soaking wet, asking if I was okay. Aww, he had totally swept me off my feet. We walked together for a while, and he told me his name's Chris, and he lives in the next neighborhood. That's it! I needed to find a way to impress Chris and also thank him for helping me. So, after some careful thinking, I decided to bake him a cake. I'd seen Rochelle bake before. It looked easy peasy. So, I baked one and gave some to my best friend Sue to try. But she spat it out and said, Ew, gross! Hmm, I sadly sat in the kitchen, staring at my pathetic cake, and wondered where I'd done wrong. That's when Rochelle stepped into the room. But to my surprise, instead of laughing at me, she patted me on the shoulder. Come here, I'll teach you how to cook. Rochelle was a good cook, so I'd be stupid not to learn from her. This doesn't mean I like her, though. I just want to win my crush's heart. So after that, each day after school, Rochelle gave me a cooking lesson. Okay, so maybe she wasn't as bad as I first thought. We tried out different recipes together and came up with our own perfect formula. And finally, I could bake a lovely heart-shaped chocolate cake by myself to confess my love to Chris. And you know what? He said, yes. I was so deeply in love with Chris that I totally forgot about my conflict with Rochelle. Chris often came over to my place. My dad and Rochelle loved him. So now, besides my dad's favorite food, Rochelle also makes Chris's favorites too. She's incredible. She could remember everything Chris loves and hates, even the trivia, like he's allergic to peanuts. We were just like a family, and I have to admit, it felt kind of good. And then, out of literally nowhere, the shock of my life happened. My dad passed away from cancer. I didn't even know he was ill. As you might guess, I totally broke down and didn't want to do anything after that. My mom and dad had both left me, just within a single year. But at least I still had Rochelle and Chris beside me. Rochelle took care of me like I was her actual daughter. I was going through such a tough time in life, but having them around made me feel like I wasn't completely alone. The grief had to fade away eventually, and it's gonna be okay from now on, I thought. Until one day, I was baking cupcakes when my dad's lawyer appeared and showed me the will. Turns out, my dad had left the house to me, but only on the condition that I had a guardian. Some woman named Laura. Huh? That's odd. I don't know anyone named Laura, but wait, I think I've heard this name from someone. Oh, my mom. When she was in her last days, mom once told me that my dad had been talking to his ex again, and her name was Laura. Could it be her? Did he seriously make his ex my guardian? Unbelievable. I had to get to the bottom of this, but how could I find this mystery Laura? I had no family. Well, besides my uncle Colin, who was living in France. So I contacted him and told him everything. He flew back at once. And although I hadn't seen him in years, 
I couldn't hold back my emotions and ended up sobbing on his shoulder. And then he told me the horrible truth. Laura is none other than the woman who had just walked through the door. It was Rochelle, the woman who had been living in my house. I couldn't believe my ears. What on earth is going on? So Rochelle moving in was no coincidence? My dad sneakily snuck her in as a maid so they could be together? My pain and disappointment were overwhelming, but I had to calm down so I could think rationally. I knew I needed to be smart and outplay Rochelle at her own game. Since then, I started watching Rochelle and noticed something strange. Rochelle and Chris were a bit too close and intimate. I often saw them whispering to each other when they thought I wasn't looking. What did this mean? Could it be that Rochelle was trying to coax my boyfriend into one of her dark schemes? Or worse still, was the guy I loved cheating on me with an older woman? My suspicions deepened. When a few days later, Chris told me he was sick, so I had to take the school bus for a couple of days. And Rochelle also asked me for a few days off. Hmm, could it just be coincidence? I didn't think so, so I decided to be a detective for once. Right after Rochelle left, I started following her. And with no surprise, she went to my boyfriend's house. Hi, Mom. Excuse me? Mom? She's his mom? So that means she not only flirted with my father, but also planted her son to distract me to take over my family's property? I trusted them. How could they be so cruel? Suddenly... I remembered a detail that I didn't notice until now. After eating the food she'd cooked, for some reason, my father became weaker and weaker and eventually passed away. Did she poison him? If that's the case, then she really is a poisonous snake in human disguise. I immediately broke up with Chris and fired Rochelle, then went home and told Uncle Colin everything. At least I had him on my side. Now what we need to do is refute her custody of the property. I'll take care of everything, and you just have to do what I say. Then, Uncle Colin helped me prepare a lawsuit against Rochelle and her son for fraud. Those two will pay the price for what they did to my father and me. Oh, but the thing is, now Rochelle didn't live here, it felt so empty. <sighs> I was so angry with her, but I also found myself missing her too. I loved and trusted her, and Chris too, and feelings like that don't just vanish overnight, but when I was still thinking about it, there was the lawyer, again, and he was accompanied by Uncle Colin. What's happening now? Miss Brittany Jensen hereby transfers the entire estate of 25 Oakwell House to Mr. Colin Jensen, as signed by both parties. Huh? Signed? When did I sign that? I snatched the paper and shouted, Scam! I never saw this paper! Uncle, what is this? Please say something! I don't know. Just follow the legal documents. No, 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 no! So Uncle Colin was just pretending to care, when really he just wanted to trick me into signing over my house? Oh God, thinking about it, it must have been that day. The day where he gave me a bunch of papers to sign, claiming that they were about me suing Rochelle and Chris. OMG, the lying con. At the time, I'd been so upset that I only skimmed the first page without looking at the following ones. I was too careless. From tomorrow, Miss Brittany Jensen will have to return all assets to Mr. Colin Jensen. You have 24 hours to prepare. I tried shouting at my uncle, and then I tried reasoning with him, but he didn't care. He just smirked at me and told me that he was just taking what was rightfully his. Ugh, what a vile man. So now, I have nothing left. I was kicked out of my own house and deceived by my own uncle. I don't know why I accidentally passed Chris's house just as he opened the door to take a delivery and our eyes met. I turned and started to run away, but Chris caught up with me and grabbed my hand. Even after the awful way I treated them both, Rochelle and Chris still invited me inside and made me dinner. I ashamedly told them what happened. Then Rochelle told me everything. It turns out that 
My father found out that he had cancer a while ago, but he didn't tell me because he saw how upset I was after losing mom, and he was afraid I would worry too much. Rochelle saw his health deteriorating and figured out what was wrong, so she volunteered to take care of him because she still cared for him. But as a friend, nothing more. As for the will, my dad understood Uncle Colin all too well and didn't trust him, so he gave custody to Rochelle, but unexpectedly, in the end, I still stupidly fell into his trap. As for Chris, I really didn't know you two knew each other until you brought him home. But at that time, I didn't want to confess I was his mother and affect your relationship. I'm sorry, Brittany. Britt, please stay here with me and Mom. We'll get through this tough time together, okay? That's right, darling. No matter what, we'll never abandon you. I... I... I'm sorry. I misunderstood you both. It's okay. Everything will be fine from now on. You'll never have to do this alone. Yeah, every dog has its day. This is totally not wrong. My life is nothing like my previous wealthy one, but I have something that my conniving, vulturous uncle doesn't have, and that's people who love and care about me. What my uncle did was wrong, and Rochelle and Chris are helping me to make a legal case against him. As for now, well, I still haven't given up on my passion for cooking and still practice with my master every day. <laughs> and you know what? I just won first prize at the city cooking competition. Right, I better go, as I have a big treat planned for Rochelle and Chris.